Good morning. Welcome to the July 2018 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, could you please introduce our agenda for the morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. For today's meeting, you will hear six items for your consideration. First, you will consider an order and notice of proposed rulemaking that would continue the Commission's efforts to make mid-band spectrum in the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band available for expanded flexible use. Second, you will consider a report in order eliminating unnecessary rules that apply to cellular service and other licensees. Third, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking seeking comment on proposed revisions to the children's television programming rules to provide broadcasters greater flexibility in meeting their children's programming obligations. Fourth, you will consider a report in order and further notice of proposed rulemaking to improve emergency alerting, including facilitating more effective EAS tests and preventing false alerts. Fifth, you will consider a report in order that forbears from legacy requirements and amends rules to facilitate the move toward nationwide number portability to promote competition between all service providers and increase network routing efficiencies. Sixth, you will consider a report in order that consolidates and streamlines the rules governing formal complaint proceedings delegated to the Enforcement Bureau. This is your agenda for today. We will begin with an item presented by the Wireless Telecommunic Telecommunications Bureau, the International Bureau, and the Office of Engineering and Technology, entitled Expanding Flexible Use of the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band, expanding flexible use in mid-band spectrum between 3.7 and 24 gigahertz, petition for rulemaking to amend and modernize parts 25 and 101 of the commission's rules to authorize and facilitate the deployment of licensed point to multi-point fixed wireless broadband service in the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band. Fixed Wireless Communications Coalition, Inc. request for mod modified coordination procedures in band shared between the fixed service and the fixed satellite service. Donald Stockdale, Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. The title of that item just trips off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Yes, Stockdale, it if you and your team are ready, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, today I'm pleased to present to you and I will call it by its shorter name, uh, the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band order and notice of proposed rulemaking. I am joined at the table today by Matthew Pearl, Paul Powell, Ariel Diamond, Anna Gentry, Jeffrey Tignor, Brian Wondrak, all of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Julius Knapp of the Office of Engineering and Technology, and Jennifer Gilsonen of the Inter International Bureau. In addition to the staff at the table, I would like to thank everyone listed on the slide for their input. Anna and Ariel will now present the item. Thank you, Don. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The order and notice of proposed rulemaking presented for your consideration today would take key steps toward quickly making mid-band spectrum available for terrestrial wireless broadband use in the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band. In doing so, this item would further the Commission's efforts to close the digital divide by providing wireless broadband connectivity across the nation and to secure U.S. leadership in advanced wireless services, such including the fifth generation wireless, Internet of Things, and other advanced spectrum-based services. First, the order would collect additional information from existing space station operations in the band and would require Earth station operators to certify that the information that they have provided to the Commission is correct. This information will inform the Commission's uh, decision making in this proceeding. Second, the notice of proposed rulemaking would propose to add a mobile allocation to all 500 megahertz and it would seek comment on how to repurpose valuable mid-band spectrum in a way that boosts innovation and investment by relying on market forces to determine the value of new <coughs> and existing services. The item would explore various transition methods for expanding flexible use, including a market-based mechanism, auction-based approaches, and alternative proposals. 
that seek to balance desired speed to market, efficiency of use, and effective accommodation of existing operations. The item would also seek comment on allowing more intensive fixed use on a shared basis in a portion of the band, as well as on future incumbent use of the band, including how to define and protect incumbent earth stations. Finally, the notice of proposed rulemaking would seek comment on service and technical rules that would enable efficient and intensive use by any new services in the band. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, and the International Bureau recommend adoption of this item and request editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Diamond, Ms. Gentry, for the presentations. I will now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome back. Uh, as someone who has spent considerable time on this issue, I thank the Chairman for bringing this important spectrum issue to vote. More than two years ago, it became readily apparent to me that a global shift in the future of spectrum had occurred, and the world was eyeing mid-band spectrum as a component for 5G development and deployment. Thus, it became vital for the United States to have a available a serious mid-band play to complement our spectrum work in the low and high bands. Since that time, I have pushed for this spectrum and other bands such as frequencies below 3.5 gigahertz to be open for commercial wireless use. Given the limitations and difficulties elsewhere in the mid-band, the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band or C-band downlink became my primary focus. Specifically, it provides a wide swath of spectrum, and it just so happens that the current primary users, certain satellite providers, are receptive to reducing their spectrum footprint. It is rare that you see the stars align to be able to execute a large change in spectrum policy. To execute this win-win scenario, certain principles, at least from my view, need to be acknowledged and respected. First, the reallocation needs to happen fairly quickly. We cannot wait five or 10 years to open the band for flexible wireless use. Second, a reallocation must release a sufficient amount of spectrum. In my mind, that is far more than the 100 megahertz initially proposed by the resident satellite providers. In particular, I have strongly advocated for at least 200 to 300 megahertz with a serious review to release even more. Third, any reallocation must fully protect the incumbent contractees that currently use C-band to bring many services to consumers. From my perspective, any final proposal that does not do this will be close to a non-starter. That doesn't mean that they all must be accommodated on remaining C-band spectrum, but their ability to offer services cannot be disrupted. And fourth, the proposal must include permit, permitting unlicensed spectrum in the C-band uplink, better known as 6 gigahertz. As a strong supporter of unlicensed spectrum use, this is a necessary ingredient to addressing the needs for more unlicensed spectrum users while meeting our statutory obligations under the Ray Bombs Act of 2018. The reality is that if everyone puts aside their preconceived notions, a final proposal in the very new fu near future can address everyone's concerns and needs. Cooperation and avoiding unnecessary tangents will be paramount. In the end, uh, adding these frequencies to the 3.5 gigahertz band, hopefully spectrum at the 3.4 gigahertz band, will provide a firm foundation of new spectrum opportunities for 5 gigahertz in the mid bands. Today's item moves sufficiently in the right direction for my purpose, at least at the NPRM stage, so I'm pleased to support it. There are, however, some items I would have done differently than what is contained in the item. As previously stated, it is utmost importance that this proceeding is concluded and spectrum is released in the marketplace quickly. There can be un un no unnecessary delays or distractions. Part of this item, while interesting, are not practical and unlikely to be adopted. I'll just mention a couple for now. Consider the record clearly supports a market-based approach, but the item veers off seeking comments on various auction mechanisms, many of which are not suggested in the record, and some which are incredibly complex or downright troubling. For example, I have spoken with a number who are scratching their heads at the transponder capacity incentive auction and are being forced to hire experts to try and make sense of it, unclear how it would work in practice. I'm concerned that such ideas may detract time and attention for more viable options. I also question whether eliminating full band, full arc is feasible. Further discussions will have to be had with industry to determine how the business model works under a different mechanism. I look forward to discussing these issues with satellite and other affected industries as we move forward. Additionally, I have serious concerns about the idea of permit to permit fixed wireless use of 160 megahertz of spectrum in the upper portion of this band. I'm fully supportive of fixed wireless, but the focus of this item should be on clearing as much spectrum as possible for flexible use. 
it doesn't make much sense to put fixed operations in 160 megahertz of this band if there are future possibilities to clear more spectrum. For example, entities have told me that 100 megahertz channels are ideal for 5G mobile operations, but taking 160 megahertz out of 500 megahertz takes two channels off the table. Once fixed operations are present, it will be hard to move them elsewhere, and mobile or other users uses would likely have to protect incumbents, minimizing its potential use. It is also unclear whether sharing between, spec between satellite and fixed users is compatible in these bands, and it's likely to be congested when all satellite use is condensed into fewer frequencies. Basically, we have no idea whether and how this proposal will work. Finally, I appreciate the chairman's effort to free up mid-band spectrum, including commitment to me to bring the 6 gigahertz NPRM to the commission's consideration this fall. This spectrum, which is next to the 5 gigahertz band, provides the best the next best opportunity other than 5.9 gigahertz to expand Wi-Fi and other unlicensed operations. Further, it will provide spectrum for new innovative opportunities for America's entrepreneurs and those who want to enter the market without the expense of purchasing spectrum at auction. I wish we were voting on this item today, but having, uh, but recognizing that it will soon be available is certainly a good outcome. I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner Riley. Commissioner Carr. Americans now send and receive nearly two exabytes of mobile data per month. And Lester, the FCC chairman, you probably have no idea how much data goes into an exabyte. So you're not alone. The World Cup final is on Sunday, so I thought I'd put it in soccer terms. So stay with me. If one gigabyte, which a lot of us are familiar with, were the size of a soccer ball, also something we're all familiar with, and you were to fill a World Cup stadium from the field to the brim, not just the field itself, but everywhere, inside the stadium, it would take 11 World Cup stadiums to contain that much data or soccer balls. Not a soccer fan, all right, try this. <laughs> With the amount of mobile data Americans send, you could transmit the entire printed collection of the Library of Congress every 12 seconds. Again, I have no idea how much that is, but people think that that will tell them something. <laughs> and Americans aren't just reading library books on their smartphones, of course, that'd be silly. They're binge watching videos. They're hearing the voices of loved ones through Volte calls. And they're engaging the world around them using augmented reality. They're lifting themselves up and they're providing more opportunities for their families. A few weeks ago in Philadelphia, I had the privilege of meeting someone who used her mobile broadband connection and a whole bunch of grit and determination to bring her family out of poverty and into a new life. Her name's Tommy. She's the mom to five kids. Many people have had an easier path in their lives. Tommy grew up in public housing. She dropped out of high school after having her first kid. And for the next 16 years, she made calls for a debt collection agency, which she referred to as a dead-end job. Tommy knew she could do more with her life, so she enrolled in Philadelphia's Orleans Technical College. It was, she put it, four years of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches often made for me by my kids. She earned a perfect 4.0 GPA. She got a job at the Public Housing Authority, and she just bought her first house. And she's starting a master's program in mental health so she can give back to her community. None of this, Tommy told me, would have been possible without a mobile broadband connection. She said broadband's the backbone of a community for finding a job, for education. A cellular mobile hotspot that she shared with her neighbors let her finish her homework, which was required to be completed online. And a mobile broadband connection, that one, enabled her to apply for employment and for admission to school. Tommy's an inspiration. Getting the chance to meet her is something that stuck, stuck with me. But in a lot of ways, her story is not unique. At the school in Philadelphia's Shardswood neighborhood where I met her, I spoke with kids that are in much the same position now that she was just a few short years ago. But today, the Public Housing Authority is partnering with a wireless carrier to give each student at that school a laptop, a tablet, and a mobile connection. The Public Housing Authority did this because digital literacy is no longer optional for the next generation. So how do we ensure that Americans, and especially the least advantaged, have the opportunity to learn, to grow, and to provide for a family of their own, like Tommy? And it begins with a connection. 
Which brings us back to this item, to all those soccer balls, the 11 World Cup stadiums filled to the brim every month. Five years from now, that data consumption will look more like 60 stadiums and growing. The challenge we face is keeping up with that demand so that everyone gets a fair shot at next generation opportunities. At the federal level, we can help. We can empower the private sector to meet Americans' mobile data demand through smart infrastructure policies and aggressive allocation of spectrum. On the infrastructure side, the Commission cut $1.6 billion of red tape in our March decision. We did so by exempting small cells, the physical building blocks of 5G, from certain federal historic and environmental reviews. And we're looking right now at additional reforms with the goal of ensuring that wireless infrastructure can be deployed in all communities. The other key input for the future of mobile broadband is in the item before us, the spectrum. And I'm proud of what the Commission has done on this front in just the past few months. In February, we paved the way for opening up spectrum above 95 gigahertz. In March, we sought comment on designating the 4.9 gigahertz band for flexible use. In April, we took a step towards bringing over 1.5 gigahertz of millimeter wave spectrum to auction. In May, we started a proceeding to put the 2.5 gigahertz band to even more productive use. In June, we finalized rules for the 24 gigahertz band and sought comment on opening up the 26 and 42 gigahertz bands as well. And just this week, Chairman Pai announced that we're moving forward with the auction of spectrum in the 37, 39, and 47 gigahertz bands next year. With these efforts in the race to 5G in front of mind, we've now freed up more spectrum than any other country in the world. We're more than four gigahertz ahead of second place China. But there's still work to be done, particularly in the mid-band, where other countries have freed up substantial amounts of spectrum. That's why today's item is so important. The C-band encompasses 500 megahertz of mid-band spectrum that some believe is primed for 5G deployments. And as the item recognizes, we have challenges in bringing more intensive use to this band, including longstanding incumbent operations. But this decision tees up a number of potential paths forward. I want to draw particular attention to the notices section on market-based mechanisms for clearing the spectrum. Under that option, we'd authorize incumbents to clear on a voluntary basis all or nearly all of the band and allow them to gauge in secondary market transactions. In my view, this could provide the quickest path to clearing the spectrum, and it could do so without the inevitable issues that arise when the Commission begins imposing mandates and repurposing the spectrum itself. Financial analysts predict that investment in 5G infrastructure will peak around 2021. So if this spectrum is to be used for 5G, it makes the most sense to press forward with options that have the best shot at bringing this spectrum online during the initial 5G rollouts. So I encourage all stakeholders to come together, as you've been doing, to help resolve these issues. After all, winning the race to 5G is important. And success, in my view, is ensuring that we get the spectrum and policies in place that will spur deployment and opportunities, not just in New York, not just in San Francisco, but also in neighborhoods like Shars Ward and North Philadelphia. This is a substantial item. I want to thank everyone in the bureaus that worked on it, especially the team in the Wireless Bureau. It has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. <coughs> The United States is not in the lead when it comes to making mid-band spectrum available for next generation 5G networks. And if you want evidence, it's right there out in the open for all to see. You can start with South Korea, which just wrapped up an auction for the 3.5 gigahertz and 28 gigahertz bands last month, generating more than $3 billion by moving the two bands together earlier this year. You can also look at the United Kingdom, which auctioned the 2.3 gigahertz and 3.4 gigahertz bands earlier this year. And in Spain, the process of auctioning 200 megahertz of spectrum in the 3.6 to 3.8 gigahertz bands is already underway. And just this morning, Italy announced that on September 10th, it will kick off an auction of 200 megahertz in the 3.6 to 3.8 gigahertz band. On top of that, 
China has already cleared and reserved the 3.3 to 3.6 gigahertz and 4.8 to 5 gigahertz bands for 5G service. We're behind. That's the not so good news. Because the price we pay when we cede leadership is a loss in early scale and a voice in standards development and device specifications that can yield innovation and jobs we want to see here on our shores. And now the good news. With today's rulemaking in order, we are doing something about it. We explore a variety of mechanisms for clearing the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band for 5G use. And if we make headway here, we can start to reclaim that lost leadership and spectrum that is so critical for 5G networks. To this end, we see comment on a wide range of proposals for opening up the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band. We ask about everything from overlay licenses to incentive auctions to capacity auctions in order to expand the possibility of flexible use in this spectrum. We also seek comment on a proposal from satellite operators that hold equal, non-exclusive rights to the entire band. Together, they have put forward a market-based mechanism to repurpose these airwaves in an expedited fashion. And this proposal is creative. But it also raises challenging questions that this agency must tackle to fulfill our statutory obligation. First, the combination of a limited number of operators, non-exclusive licensing, and the scarcity of mid-band spectrum could create opportunities to price this resource above what a truly competitive market with a large pool of fungible spectrum would support. Second, that means we need to acknowledge that what incumbent providers stand to reap from a secondary market sale of this repurposed spectrum is significant. We need a framework to ensure that this approach truly serves the public interest. Third, we need to acknowledge that these frequencies are used right now by television and radio broadcasters and cable operators to deliver programming to more than 100 million American households. So in the end, I believe we are going to need a record that addresses all three of these challenges in addition to the other proposals that aim to expand flexible use in this band. Finally, I believe that any effort to reclaim our leadership in mid-band spectrum for 5G needs to include other airwaves like the 3.5 gigahertz band, which for several years has been ready to go but inexplicably remains mired in this agency's bureaucracy. In addition, we need a spectrum calendar. We have no reason for not being completely transparent about how and when new resources will be made available to the public. With a blitz of proceedings before us involving the 2.5, 3.5, 3.7 to 4.2, 4.9, 5.9, 6, 12, 24, 26, 28, 32, 37, 39, 42, 47, 50, and above 95 gigahertz bands, and there won't be a test later. <laughs> it's time to put every band on a schedule that is publicly available for all to see. There's no reason for this agency to be so opaque about what is being auctioned and when. Moreover, when we do hold auctions, we should put a premium on auctioning 5G bands together instead of one by one, as proposed for the 28 and 24 gigahertz auctions coming up this fall. Now, if we do these things, all of these things, we have a fighting chance to lead in the deployment of next generation wireless networks for which mid-band spectrum is key, both at home and abroad. But most importantly, we need to get started right here, right now. And as a result, today's rulemaking and order has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. In the 1975 summertime blockbuster Jaws, uh, Police Chief Martin Brody, after a single glance at the massive shark lurking just beneath the water's surface, memorably observed, you're going to need a bigger boat. Well, this summer we face a similar situation as next generation 5G wireless innovations loom. It is apparent that we are going to need a bigger boat as well, or in our case, more spectrum. Well, our boat gets bigger today as we aim to make more spectrum available for the 5G future. Our focus here is on making more intensive use of the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band, commonly called the C-band. 
Now, to help us figure out the way forward, we authorized the collection of additional information from the band's current users. And that data will help us figure out how to accommodate the needs of incumbents, which are primarily using the band to provide fixed satellite service. It will also enable us to free up more spectrum for advanced wireless services. Additionally, we seek comment on ways to open up some or all of this band for terrestrial wireless broadband use. Most notably, we tee up a number of market mechanisms for reallocating C-band spectrum. We hope to identify a mechanism that will unleash a frenzy of activity in this band, like the $3,000 bounty that was placed on the shark in Jaws, but with a lot less blood blooding, hopefully. Uh, many thanks to the terrific staff that uh, worked on this very complicated item. Uh, Don uh, Stockdale illustrated the names, but I will simply recognize the terrific uh, cross-office effort from uh, WTB, IB, OET, OSP, MG, and OGC. This effort has my A-OK. -okay. Uh, so with that, we'll call for a vote on the item. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to item number two on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the second item on your agenda, entitled Amendment of Parts 1 and 22 of the Commission's Rules with regard to the cellular service, including changes in licensing of unserved area, will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. And once again, Donald Stockdale, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Stockdale, uh, please proceed when you're ready. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, next I am pleased to present to you the Cellular Service Reform Third Report and Order. I'm joined at the table today by Suzanne Tetro, Roger Noel, Linda Chang, and Nina Shafrin. In addition to the staff at the table, I would like to thank the Commission staff listed on the slide for their input. Nina will now present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I am pleased to present the Cellular Service Reform Third Report and Order. This item builds on the Commission's recent reform efforts by taking additional steps to reduce unnecessary regulatory burdens, not only for licensees in the 800 megahertz cellular service, but also for other licensees governed by Part 22 of our rules. First, the order would delete certain administrative and record-keeping rules adopted more than two decades ago that apply to all Part 22 licensees. Deleting them will remove unnecessary burdens and promote regulatory consistency across competing wireless services. Comparable regulations are not imposed on newer commercial wireless services, such as broadband PCS and the 700 megahertz service. The item also would delete other rules relating to station control points, operation of mobile stations, and operational control of mobile devices, as well as certain obligations concerning equal employment opportunity programs and reports. These rules are largely duplicative of later adopted rules and deleting them will simplify compliance. In the absence of strong record support, the order would decline to pursue at this time the possible relocation of Part 22 cellular, Part 24 PCS, and other wireless mobile service rules into a single set of regulations and possible reorganization of the Part 27 rules. It also would decline to delete certain Part 22 rules raised by commenters finding either that deletion would not serve the public interest or that the issues are being addressed in a separate proceeding. With this item, the Commission would terminate the cellular reform proceeding in docket WT 12-40. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, is this your first presentation in open meetings? It's not? Uh, well, well done anyway. <laughs> <laughs> first one that I can recall in recent memory. But thank you for the presentation and for the great work on a very thoughtful item. I will now turn to comments from the bench. Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, no statement from me. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Uh, yes. I remember those mornings fondly, the Saturdays of old, when I'd wake up, take my kids like my father did for me, on the rounds of the federally regulated communication stations. First stop, as we know, was the cable operator's office to study channel lineups posted in paper. Playing guess the channel kept the kids entertained for hours. 
Then we stroll over to our local broadcast station, inspect their licenses. My four-year-old got a real kick out of that. But most relevant to today, we then hop over to our favorite local cell tower, where fortunately, the wireless carrier took a very literal reading of the FCC's rule that, quote, each station in the public mobile service have at least one control point and a person on duty. Now, to many people, the person manning that station was just another nameless employee of a large, faceless corporation. But to my kids, to me, switching station Sam was our friend. <laughs> and now, thanks to the punitive, deregulatory regime pursued by Chairman Pai, <laughs> those tender Saturday mornings are gone. Sam's being upskilled to corporate. It's good for him. Better pay, 401k. But when I had to tell my one-year-old son that switching station Sam isn't going to be there this Saturday morning after today's open meeting, he asked me. He said, Dad, what will we have left? As I was tucking him in, I leaned over, and I assured him. I said, we still have KidVid segments to time. <laughs> he said, 30 minutes, Dad, right? I said, 30 minutes. No schoolhouse rocks. I said, nope, too short. We then fist bumped and he fell asleep. Uh, thank you for your work on the item. <laughs> I appreciate it. To be clear, are you dissenting or approving from the uh, item? That'll be approved. A hard, a hard approved. <laughs> thank you, I think, Commissioner. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Rosenworcel. I approve no statement. <laughs> Man. Um, uh, throughout my tenure, I've emphasized the need to eliminate unnecessary and outdated regulations. And in this order alone, we are eliminating six such rules. Three of them imposed antiquated administrative and record-keeping burdens on a subset of wireless licensees, including those in the 800 megahertz cellular band. Uh, for instance, the licensees, as Commissioner Carr has observed, have to maintain hard copies of such authorizations and make them available for inspection by the FCC. Given that license authorizations are now available electronically through the Commission's universal licensing system, this is pointless. Uh, the other three rules that we're removing from the Code of Federal Regulations apply to the same subset of wireless licensees, but are duplicative of rules contained elsewhere. They serve no purpose but to clutter our rule books. So this item has my support and to those uh, potential critics out there, including the legions of children who spend their weekends uh, attending to such authorizations and the parents who uh, apparently lack for other entertainment options. <laughs> Rest assured that the d multiplicity of small cells that will have to be deployed across the country will give the kids of the future much work to do. With that, we'll call for a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Approved. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approved. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you please take us to the next item on the agenda? <laughs> item three, entitled Children's Television Programming Rules, Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative, will be presented by the Media Bureau, and Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, Ms. Carey, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Media Bureau presents a notice of proposed rulemaking to update the children's television programming rules to reflect changes in the video programming industry since the rules were originally adopted over 20 years ago. Sitting with me at the table from the Media Bureau's Policy Division are Martha Heller and Kathy Berthot, and Kathy will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we are pleased to present this notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to revise the children's television programming rules. More than two decades ago, the Commission adopted rules implementing the directive in the Children's Television Act that the Commission consider in reviewing television license renewals, the extent to which the licensee has served the educational and informational needs of children through the licensee's overall programming, including programming specifically designed to serve such needs. The video programming marketplace has changed dramatically since that time. Live TV viewing is increasingly declining as more consumers are watching video programming using DVRs and video on demand. There are more options than ever today for children's programming from non-broadcast sources, including cable children's networks, over-the-top providers, and internet sites. Multicasting now makes it possible for broadcast stations to offer multiple streams of free over-the-air programming, including channels devoted exclusively to children's programming. 
Given these changes, the time is ripe to revisit the children's programming rules, to modify outdated requirements, and provide broadcasters more flexibility as they serve the educational and informational needs of children. The notice seeks comment on specific changes to the criteria that children's programming must meet to be counted as core programming. Specifically, the notice tentatively concludes that the requirement that core programming be at least 30 minutes in length and be regularly scheduled weekly programming should be eliminated. Seeks comments on whether the existing hours for core programming should be expanded. Tentatively concludes that the requirement that non-commercial stations identify core programming by displaying the EI symbol should be eliminated seeks comment on whether to continue to require broadcasters to provide information on the core programming to publishers of programming guides, and tentatively concludes that the children's television programming report should be filed on an annual rather than quarterly basis. In addition, the notice seeks comment on whether to update the three-hour per week processing guideline used in determining compliance with the children's programming rules. The notice also proposes to allow multicasting chastens to choose on which of their free over the year streams to air their required programming. Core programming hours intensively concludes that the additional core programming guideline applicable to multicasting stations should be eliminated. Lastly, the notice seeks comment on whether the policies governing the preemption of children's programming should be revised. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking and request editorial provisions to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Berthot, for the presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I should start by thanking uh, now corporate Sam for keeping my <laughs> colleague and his family entertained over the years, but we're here to talk about KidVid. I apologize in advance. I have a long statement, so sit back and put your feet up. Today, the Commission takes an important first step in modernizing our children's programming requirements, commonly referred to as KidVid. We seek comment on rules written in 1996 and last updated in 2006. I want to thank the Chairman for allowing me to take the lead on this important topic and my colleagues for their thoughtful consideration of this item. As the item itself recognizes, it has been over 20 years since the Commission first adopted rules implementing the Children's Television Act. Since initiation, there's been a major shift in the way viewers consume content. Live television viewing has declined and broadcast television is no longer the same position it once was. Today, a child, including mine, can consume programming not only on cable channels such as Nickelodeon, Nick Jr., Disney Channel, Discovery Family, and Animal Planet, but also through the overtop providers like Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu that offer treasure trove of original and pre previously aired children's programming. Content is available online via National Geographic Kids, Scholastic Kids, Smithsonian Kids, and others. And broadcast stations, both commercial and non-commercial, have used their multicast channels to launch 24-7 children's television programming, including PBS Kids and Ion Television's Cubal. Specifically, Ion uses its multicast stream to allow it to provide over 500% more children's programming than is required by the Commission's rules. Overall, this is a great success story for children of all ages and background. In fact, I would venture to say that there's no better time to be a consumer of such content. Given these changes, it is unsurprising there's been bipartisan agreement that reviewing the KidVid rules is appropriate. In a letter from 25 center-right consumer advocates, the con commission was encouraged to update our KidVid rules, in part because of the significant changes since the 1990s, particularly in terms of access to new content delivery programs. The letter continued, in previous decades, broadcasters were the primary access point, but now the vast majority of American households have more options. According to Nielsen, there are only 2.5% of households with cable or without cable or internet access in the home. Of those homes, only 20% have a child between the ages of two and 17, and that leaves 0.5% of households with children that don't have cable or internet in the house but individuals in the homes may be accessing content like PBS app, like the PBS app on their wireless devices. In a separate letter from 11 public interest groups, it was recognized that major changes have taken place in the video market and that it's appropriate for the FCC to take a fresh look at its rules in light of these changes. Similarly, in an op-ed, a senior policy analyst with the Independent Women's Forum explained that educational children's content was grown exponentially over the last 
few decades thanks to technology. However, regulation governing kids' television programming has not kept pace. And the multi a Multicultural Media tel Telecom and Internet Council, MMTC, recently stated, needless to say, the media landscape has changed significantly since the rules went into effect in 1990. We believe media modernization is a good thing, particularly as it impacts multicultural consumers, creators, and minority broadcasters. Despite this, broadcasters continue to operate under archaic commission rules. In essence, to carry out the CTA, the commission set forth three paths for broadcasters to receive their broadcast license renewals, the main asset of a local station. Under Category A, the commission established a processing guideline that permits the Media Bureau to process a license renewal if the broadcast station aired on average, uh, on an, an average of three hours per week of core programming. Due to the greater uncertainty provided by this option, most broadcasters go this route. Category B includes combining other programming, such as PSAs or short-form programs with core programming to reach the three-hour processing guideline. For broadcasters that do not meet requirements of Category A or Category B, the full commission must approve the renewal application. Under this approach, broadcasters can demonstrate compliance with CTA by relying on special non-broadcast efforts. This rulemaking seeks comment on ways to improve each processing guideline. For Category B, this item seeks comment on how to bring more certainty to the process in order to increase its utilization. The Commission also seeks comment on how to provide more guidance on what constitutes non -special, or special non-broadcast efforts. On this option, I can envision a scenario as authorized by the CTA in which a broadcaster could provide funding for another entity in the market doing a better job at serving children's needs. For example, I recently traveled to Lansing, Michigan, and had the opportunity to visit WKAR. Not only was WKAR the first public broadcasting station to go through the repack, but it also just received its it's received the first special temporary authority ex 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 experimental license, excuse me, for non-commercial stations to initiate ATSC 3.0 setup and broadcasting. Yet, what struck me on my tour was its pervasive dedication to children. WKAR provides 57 hours a week of children's programming on its primary stream and an amazing 160 hours a week on its 24-7 PBS Kids multicasting channel. Beyond the programming, the station is experimenting with how best to engage children through other technologies, including the Internet, via handheld tablets targeted to the very young and those in need. Is there a way that a broadcaster in the local market could enhance WKAR's work rather than air programming blocks that may be rarely watched. I hope comments on this proceeding will help establish a workable framework for at least some broadcasters to take advantage of this approach. For category A, the item questions whether three hours per week remains the appropriate requirement or if another amount of time is more suitable. The item also considers whether the weekly requirement should be an annual requirement, and if so, what protections are needed to ensure that children's programming is aired throughout the course of the year. The item also asks a series of questions on the definition of core programming. Unfortunately, the current requirements for programming to constitute as core impose real opportunity costs on broadcasters and a result their viewers. For example, to meet the commission's burdensome definition, broadcasters have foregone local newscasts, public affairs programming, and live events on Saturday mornings in order to air their mandated core programming. Moreover, the current definition does not reflect how children currently consume television content. For example, today our rules require programming to be at least 30 minutes in length in order to count as core. As a parent of a two-year-old, I can attest that children are not watching programming in 30-minute blocks. Even worse, beyond not reflecting the market realities, this requirement has killed off shorter, high-quality programs that were once popular and educational, such like Schoolhouse Rock and In the News. For these reasons, we tentatively conclude to eliminate this requirement. We also ask questions about the time period in which children's programming must air. Currently, our rules only count programming as core if it's aired between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. But with the rise in DVRs and on-demand programming, as well as streaming services, appointment, re appointment viewing has rapidly, rapidly declined. Gone are the days when children wake up to Saturday mornings to set 
time to catch their favorite shows. For my part, when my daughter wants Blaze and the Monster Machines, her favorite show, she wants it at that moment, not some future Saturday. Therefore, this item questions whether the time period outlined in our rules should be extended or alternatively eliminated altogether. Next, our rules require that programming be regularly scheduled at least weekly in order to count as core. Again, not only does this, not only does this no longer reflect the way chairman, the chi excuse me, the children and the chairman <laughs> consume content, but it has had the unintended consequence of eliminating once popular, highly acclaimed programming such as ABC's after school specials and CBS school break specials. As the item makes clear, eliminating this requirement will allow broadcasters to receive credit for airing more types of children's programming. To me, it seems logical that allowing broadcasters to offer a greater variety of children's programming that is responsive to consumer demand rather than commission mandate will be a huge win for the children that consume content. The item likewise looks at our on-air notification and program guide requirements and asks a series of questions on how to modernize these rules. It also seeks to streamline the reporting requirements associated with our rules. Currently, our rules require quarterly reports from broadcasters to document their KidVid requirement compliance. In these reports, broadcasters must list all the programs they aired in the previous quarter to meet the Commission's three-hour processing guideline and all the programming it plans to air in the future following next quarter. This is redundant. The item considers ways to reduce our paperwork burdens while still ensuring that the Commission can confirm that our requirements are met. For example, the item considers making the quarterly requirement an annual requirement and only requiring information about programming actually aired, not broadcasters' futuristic plans. Similarly, we seek comment on whether to revise our rules regarding reports demonstrating compliance with the limits on commercial matter in children's programming from a quarterly filing to an annual filing. Finally, the item revisits our rules on multi cast stations. Specifically, the item proposes to allow broadcasters to choose which of their free over-the-air streams to air their KidVid programming. To the over-the-air viewer, it should not matter which station the programming is aired on since all are available free. In conclusion, I want to re-emphasize that the launch of this rulemaking is the beginning of the process, not the end. That means everyone will have plenty of time to provide the requisite analysis of the proposed rule changes that I just outlined that the Commission moves forward before the Commission moves forward on any final decision. Despite this, some have argued that we should switch to a notice of proposed, switch from our notice of proposed rulemaking to a notice of inquiry. In this case, switching from an NPRM to an NOI is nothing more than Washington speak for injecting unnecessary delay and distraction. We can and will obtain the same data in an NPRM that we could in any NOI. I did, however, make clear from the outset and throughout this process that I stood ready to work with anyone on this rulemaking to reframe or ask additional questions <laughs> so that it appropriately explores ways to bring added flexibility to local broadcasters without harming children watching current programming. That's why when Commissioner Rosenworcel, my good friend, requested that I replace the tentative conclusions in this document with questions, I was willing to accept these edits. To be clear, it's not the direction I would have preferred. I feel more strongly that uh, the more direction can help assist those commenting in the proceedings. But I agreed to this proposal and requested that the Media Bureau make the edits. Despite this concession, I was informed that we were not quite able to gather sufficient bipartisan support. Having been unable to reach agreement, the item we'll, we will vote on today appears very similar to the draft item circulated three weeks ago. Well, I'm disappointed that despite my willingness to negotiate, we will not receive unanimous support for today's item. I continue to commit to anyone who is interested in working in faith that my door and mind remain, remains open <coughs> as we receive comments and additional data throughout this proceeding. I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Thanks. In 1990, as we heard, Congress recognized the importance of children's educational programming when it passed the Children's Television Act. The statute requires the Commission to consider the extent to which a licensee has served the educational and information needs of children when the agency conducts its review of broadcast stations' license renewals. The FCC rules implementing these provisions have gone without major changes since 1996, and a lot has changed since then. Uh, despite the appearance, I graduated from high school after 1996, but more relevant, the video marketplace 
has responded to consumer demand for children's programming in new ways. For those broadcasters that are subject to the FCC's KidVid rules, many now exceed the requirements imposed on them by federal law, including by offering 24-hour children's programming on dedicated, over-the-air, multicast streams. Moreover, outlets that have never been subject to the FCC's KidVid rules, like Disney's and Nickelodeon's cable channels, now provide 24-7 children's programming. And this is in addition to the over-the-top and online providers like Netflix, YouTube, and Hulu that provide a nearly endless lineup of on-demand children's programming while being exempt from our KidVid rules. Moreover, we're seeing that the FCC's existing approach has been preventing broadcasters from airing well-recognized educational and informational children's programs that run infrequently or for less than 30 minutes. In light of all these developments in the market, I'm glad the Commission is seeking comment on whether we should revise essentially our 1996 approach while continuing to abide by Congress's decisions in the Children's Television Act. I want to thank Commissioner O'Reilly for his very thoughtful work on advancing this item and getting us here, and recognize the work as well that the Media Bureau has put in on this proceeding. Uh, I appreciate all that work, and the item has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. I'm a mom. I don't talk about it a lot, but last I checked, I'm the only one here on this dais serving at the Federal Communications Commission who can make that claim. Now, of course, being a mother is my sweetest accomplishment and greatest source of joy, but it's hard. A household with two jobs, two kids, and too little time in the day is not for the faint of heart. And as every mother knows, Every little thing that makes it easier to get through the day with your children healthy and safe is a thing you can get behind and support. I marvel at the way that video content for kids has changed. I know during my childhood, my mother could tell you with Swiss-like precision the time and channel of our favorite programming. On so many occasions, that programming held our interest and kept us safe and sound when there were competing demands on her time. Of course, my children and my experience with them, it's different. They can call up a range of kid-focused content when they want it and where they want it, which is usually on any screen handy. Of course, they still need my permission first. <laughs> but when it comes to the availability of children's programming, so much is so different now. But it's also important to note what has not changed. What has not changed is that this agency has a duty under the law. The Children's Television Act requires us to limit advertising and during the license renewal process, consider how a station has served the educational and informational needs of children. To implement this law, the agency suggested stations provide three hours of children's content a week. It's important that we take our duty under the law seriously for my children and for so many others across the country who are not as fortunate. Children in this country face enormous challenges. Survey the news, sample the stories about violence in our schools and children being separated from their parents at the border, and it's hard to conclude anything but respect for children by those in power in Washington is at a low point. I'm afraid today's rulemaking is consistent with that trend. I understand the need to modernize our rules. As a mother, I see how beneficial it is to have so many more places to turn for quality content online. But I also know that this agency has reported that 24 million Americans lack broadband at home. That includes a quarter of the low-income households with children under eight at home. Moreover, nearly eight in 10 Americans report that they live paycheck to paycheck. In fact, 59% of Americans can barely save $100 a month, which is roughly the cost of a cable or satellite subscription. Millions of households, especially in rural and low-income communities, rely on over-the-air television for their children's programming. 
However, if you read this rulemaking, these realities are curiously absent. There is a lot of hand-wringing about change, but too little data science to suggest what children it affects and what we should do about it. Don't just take my word for it. Take note that groups as diverse as the Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood, the Parents Television Council, and Common Sense Media, as well as the author of the American Academy of Pediatrics Policy on Media and Young Minds, they've all come together and urged us to slow down and do this right. They too see the need for modernizing this agency's approach to children's programming, but they believe that this rulemaking is not the way to do it. I think they're right. I regret my colleagues refused to convert this effort to a notice of inquiry so that we could include the evidence we need to proceed fairly. I am disappointed that this rulemaking all but announces where we are headed to a future with less quality children's programming that is harder for most families to locate and watch. Moreover, I regret that dozens of times the text before us cites the need to ease industry burdens of serving our children with educational programming under the law. But it never once cites children, parents, families, or mothers. So take it from this one. This is not the effort our children deserve. It takes the values in the Children's Television Act and instead of modernizing them for the digital age, it seeks to discard them with a cruel disregard for the children it leaves behind. I appreciate that my colleague, Commissioner O'Reilly, made efforts to work with me to adjust the text of this rulemaking. However, I will regretfully dissent. While I support updating our policies under the Children's Television Act, I believe what we have here fails to do so in a way that accurately reflects some of our most important responsibilities under the law. Sure. <clears throat> when I was a kid in rural Kansas in the late 1970s and early 1980s, watching television meant using a TV set to view one of three broadcast channels. And the available children's programming largely consisted of Saturday morning cartoons. He-Man and Thunder the, Thundar the Barbarian were particularly savored in our household. <laughs> um, and PBS shows like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But things are, of course, incredibly different today. A wide range of children's educational programming is available to them, not only from broadcast television, but through cable channels, over-the-top providers, and the internet. When my own kids talk about watching TV, for instance, they typically have in mind streaming one of their favorite videos on an iPad. Shimmer and shine, most unfortunately, is what is plaguing our household at the moment. Unfortunately, the FCC's current children's TV rules don't reflect the vast changes that have revolutionized the video marketplace in recent years. It is beyond time to take a fresh look at our so-called KidVid regulations and explore how they should be modernized. I would like to thank Commissioner O'Reilly for taking the lead on formulating this notice of proposed rulemaking. He outlined very well the issues at stake as well as the thoughtful approach the commission chooses to take. I will have a longer statement for the record, but for now suffice it to say that we look forward to an uh, uh, open and active conversation on these issues going forward. With that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Dissent. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to the Media Bureau for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, the fourth item on your agenda, entitled Amendment of Part 11 of the Commission's Rules Regarding the Emergency Alert System, Wireless Emergency Alerts, will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Lisa Folks, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, Ms. Folks, whenever your team is ready to go, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau is pleased to present a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks to improve the effectiveness and reliability of America's emergency alert systems. If adopted, 
Today's item would be the latest in a series of actions that the Commission has undertaken to strengthen both the emergency alert system, which delivers warnings to the public over television and radio, and wireless emergency alerts, which warn the public over their wireless devices. The report and order would make it easier for local officials to test the emergency alert system and would improve awareness of the system through public service announcements. The report and order also would keep the FCC better, help the FCC become better informed of any false alerts so that we can work with stakeholders to address them going forward. The further, the further notice of proposed rulemaking would seek comment on additional actions that the commission could take to help address false emergency alerts and improve the delivery of wireless emergency alerts. My alerting team is seated with me at the table. They are Nikki McGinnis, Deputy Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Gregory Cook, Deputy Chief of the Bureau's Policy and Licensing Division, and David Munson, Attorney Advisor in the Policy and Licensing Division. Mr. Monson will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Pai and Commissioners. As Chief Folks mentioned, today's report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking seek to improve the effectiveness and reliability of both the Emergency Alert System, or EAS, and Wireless Emergency Alert, or WIA, system. The report and order would improve the Emergency Alert System as follows. First, the report and order codifies procedures for performing live code tests which are local and regional tests of the EAS that use the same alert codes as and function identically to alerts issued for an actual emergency. Live code EAS tests have previously been addressed by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau on a case-by-case -case basis. The new requirements would allow alert originators to conduct two live code tests within any calendar year. The new requirements remove the burdens associated with the filing of waiver requests while retaining the public outreach requirements developed for such waivers that make live code tests such a useful tool for public safety exercises. In this regard, the, pub the report and order would condition the use of live codes on an explicit statement in the alert to the extent technically feasible that it is a test as well as on outreach by the alert originator to the public, media, and other public safety entities, particularly 911 call centers, about the test. Allowing live code tests to be conducted with these safeguards in place can increase the operational proficiency of alert originators and better train communities in how to respond to actual alerts. Second, to enhance community preparedness, the report and order would permit authorized public service announcements about the EAS to include the system's attention signal, that is the attention-grabbing eight-second two-tone audio signal that the public hears before the alert audio message airs. In addition, the order would permit authorized public service announcements to use a simulation of the EAS header code tones, which are the three short audible tones that precede the attention signal. Because the public service announcements would be using a simulation of the header code, there would be no possibility that a public service announcement would inadvertently trigger the initiation of an actual alert. Third, to help prevent false alerts, the report and order would adopt requirements that EAS equipment be configured to reject alerts that contain invalid digital signatures and alerts whose origination and or expiration times fail to fall within certain time specifications. Finally, to provide the Commission with the information necessary to identify and mitigate problems associated with false EAS alerts, the report and order revises the EAS rules to require that no later than 24 hours of an EAS participant's discovery, and by that we mean sorry, actual knowledge, that it has transmitted or otherwise sent a false alert to the public, that the EAS participant, such as a broadcaster or cable system, send an email to the FCC's 24-7 Operations Center, informing the Commission of the event and of any details that the EAS participant may have concerning the event. <clears throat> the further notice of proposed rulemaking seeks comment on various actions to minimize the potential for and speed correction of false alerts issued over the EAS. 
Specifically, the further notice seeks comment on whether there is a need for additional false alert and lockout reporting beyond the for false alert reporting requirement that would be adopted in the report and order and how best such additional reporting could be implemented. And it proposes to require that state EAS plans include procedures for preventing and correcting false alerts. The further notice also seeks comment on the performance of the WIA system, specifically whether factors such as network distribution or cell tower placement might delay or prevent delivery of WIA messages to the public, how stakeholders could report WIA performance, and whether, and if so how, the Commission should take measures to address inconsistent delivery of WIA alerts, such as adopting technical standards or benchmarks. The Bureau recommends adoption of the item and requests editorial privilege is extending to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Munson, for the presentation. Uh, we will now turn to comments from the bench. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the emergency alert system serves many important purposes. First and foremost, it is the method for the president to communicate with Americans during the time of crisis, which luckily has never needed to be used. ES also serves as a means for local government agencies to inform communities of hazards, especially potential catastrophic weather events, as well as amber alerts. Basically, if you hear those specific catchy tones, you should know that it's serious. Generally, I can support the item's authorization of conducting live code tests to ensure the system works. At the same time, however, the code should be used sparingly so that people take it seriously when there's an actual emergency. I'm pleased that today's item incorporates my suggestion to limit the number of live, live code tests. An alert originator may conduct no more than two per year, and the item states that it is the Commission's intention that a particular area should not receive any more than two live code tests per year. Such limitations should ensure that people do not disregard these alerts. If people come to expect that when those alert, alert signals go off that they may not be real, there's a very high likelihood that they will ignore potentially life-saving information. For this reason and others, I oppose using simulated EAS tones for public service announcements. It is one thing to test the system, albeit infrequently, but it is quite another to allow these sacrosanct tones to be used for PSAs. Americans should not fear that they are in imminent danger just to realize it's an announcement intended to inform them, inform them that, ha that the loud screeching sound is what they will hear if it in truly harm's way. Talk about creating an environment where people are likely to grow to ignore real warnings. We've been told that this only codifies waivers we've been giving for years to the Department of Homeland Security to conduct such, such PSAs. But somehow, after years and years, we need to give blanket authority to do PSAs without any limitations. I dissent to the adoption of similar rules. I dissented to the adoption of similar rules for the wireless emergency alerts in 2016 and still disagree with its inclusion here today. Therefore, I dissent to this one portion of the item and will support the rest of the item with some serious reservations outlined in my longer statement. I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. For the EAS system to be effective, two conditions must be met. First, the public must know what emergency alerts are, what they sound or look like, and what they signify. Second, Americans must have confidence that when they hear or see an emergency alert, they can rely and act on the potentially life-saving information that's provided. These essential conditions are at the heart of today's decision. Although the beeps and screeches of EAS signals are known by many of us, first responders recognize a need to ensure the public is familiar with these alerts. Indeed, EAS participants have urged the Commission to allow the broadcast of PSAs that include the EAS attention signal as one educational tool. For example, New York's Emergency Management Department notes that people with cognitive disabilities as well as those who are hard of hearing would benefit from EAS PSAs. Many organizations have created such PSAs, but our rules currently prevent alert tones from being used in them, given our concern about alert fatigue and commercial actors potentially misusing signals to get the attention of consumers' eyes or ears. Over the past few years, we've dealt with the tension between our rule and the need for educational PSAs by issuing a string of condition-laden waivers to select groups. In fact, little known fact, that was one of my first projects as a 
staff from OGC was helping to put together some of those first rounds of waivers. But given our experience under these waivers, I'm glad that we're now codifying our process for the use of alert tones in these PSAs. And we do so in a way that allows the entities with substantial expertise on emergency alerts, such as FEMA and local emergency management agencies, to determine their appropriate use. We all know that false alerts can shake Americans' confidence in the emergency alert system. And after what happened in Hawaii a few months ago, we've also seen the panic and harm that false alerts can cause. So I want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to two changes to today's decision that will help us act on some lessons learned. First, we're now moving straight to a rule that requires EAS participants to inform the FCC when they know they've transmitted a false alert, rather than seeking comment on the idea for a second time. Second, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau's report on the Hawaii false alert, the agency staff recommended that states develop standard operating procedures for responding to false alerts. So I'm glad that my colleagues have agreed to propose implementing this recommendation through our review of state EAS plans rather than only seeking comment on doing so. I want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to these changes, which can help strengthen our EAS system and Americans' confidence in these alerts. Thank you as well to the Public Safety Bureau for the work on the item. It has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. In January, the people of Hawaii woke to ominous messages flashing on their mobile phones, streaming in from social media, booming from radio stations, and lighting up their television screens. These messages commanded all who saw and heard them to seek immediate shelter due to a ballistic missile threat. They included those haunting words, this is not a drill. But it was. In fact, it was a false missile alert that went horribly wrong, causing fear and panic throughout a state keenly aware of security threats in the Pacific. In April, I testified at a field hearing in Honolulu organized by Senator Schatz to investigate what went wrong and identify ways to make it right. I joined the Director of Operations of U.S. Pacific Command, the leadership of the Hawaii Department of Defense, and other public safety officials to offer ideas to help prevent a false alert of this magnitude from ever happening again. I put forth two ideas in my testimony. First, I suggested that we set up a system for reporting false alerts so we can learn from our errors going forward. Second, I suggested that we use the state emergency alert system plans that are filed at this agency to promote best practices and help halt the kind of problems we saw in Hawaii. Today, I'm pleased to see that the FCC has taken up these two ideas by ensuring that the emergency alert system participants actually do report false alerts, and, and we ask them to do so in this order. At the same time, we seek comment on how to revise state plans in order to prevent future false alerts. I sincerely hope we can conclude this rulemaking before we reach the one-year anniversary of the events in Hawaii. In addition, in the order before us, we also adopt a policy to support live testing of the emergency alert system under specific conditions in order to improve training and public understanding. And some, this is good for public safety, and it has my full support. Thank you, Commissioner. In an episode of The Office, Dwight Schrute decides to conduct a surprise fire drill for his fellow Dunder Mifflin employees. He starts a fire in a trash can, he cuts the phone lines, and seals the office exits. Needless to say, this drill does not end well. Among other things, Angela's cat Bandit fell through a ceiling panel, uh, Stanley suffered a heart attack, windows were smashed, and office equipment was destroyed. Now, this absurd scene, of course, makes us laugh, but it also shows the dangers posed by false emergency alerts and poorly conducted emergency tests, as well as the consequences of not adequately preparing for real emergencies. Well, today, we seek to improve emergency preparedness, facilitate better testing, 
and reduce the frequency of false alerts by making changes to our emergency alert system, or EAS. First, we amend our rules to recognize live code tests as a separate category of alert exercise. This will enable alert originators to simulate an end-to-end -end test of the EAS. Live code testing can help identify gaps in training, assess the readiness of equipment, and ensure that alerts reach intended audiences. And to minimize public confusion and alert fatigue, we require that jurisdictions limit their tests to two per year, and that each live code test explicitly state that the event is a test by text troll and or audio as technically feasible. Second, we amend our rules to allow EAS participants to include the two-tone attention signal in EAS PSAs. We also permit the use of a simulation of the header code tones, the familiar three audible tones that precede the attention signal. Now, if used properly, PSAs can help raise public awareness and emergency preparedness. And therefore, the PSA must explain that the intention signal and or simulated header code is only being used in the context of a PSA to familiarize and educate the public about emergency alerting. Third, we require EAS participants to reconfigure their equipment to reject alerts that contain invalid digital signatures and alerts whose expiration time falls outside of an alert's specified time limits. This should reduce the frequency of false alerts reaching the American public. Fourth, uh, based on a report issued by our own Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau on Hawaii's false missile alert earlier this year, we require any EAS participant to notify the FCC's operations center no later than 24 hours after having actual knowledge that it has transmitted or otherwise sent a false alert to the public. We believe that such notifications will help inform the FCC and FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as we aim to identify and to solve problems with the EAS. And finally, in the further notice, we propose to require that state EAS plans include procedures to help prevent false alerts and to swiftly mitigate their consequences should one occur. We also seek comment on whether we should do more to improve reporting on false alerts in a situation known as lockouts, which occurs when multiple cable set-top boxes uh, cannot return to normal operation after an EAS alert or test, whether we should take more steps to protect against false alerts at the state level, and how we can measure the accuracy and reliability of wireless emergency alerts, or WIA, through technical criteria, performance standards, or public feedback. Now, getting back to the office, when uh, Michael Scott thought that his employees were trapped in a burning building during Dwight's fire simulation, he declared, everyone for himself. Well, fortunately, our nation's first responders do not embrace that ethos, and neither do our terrific staff here at the FCC. And so it is with gratitude to the dedicated folks of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, ably led by Chief Lisa Folks, that I am very pleased to support this effort. Uh, with that, we will call for a vote. Commissioner O'Reilly. Approve in part and dissent in one part. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approve. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Uh, thanks to Mr. Cook and the staff for the great work. And Mr. Munson, sorry. <laughs> um, Madam Secretary, can you please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth item on your agenda will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and is entitled Nationwide Number Portability, Number Portability Numbering Policies for Modern Communications and Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Ms. Monteith, if you're ready, the floor is yours. It's still morning, so good morning, <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. The Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration a report and order on nationwide number portability. This item, if adopted, would help set the stage for nationwide number portability a system that will allow consumers and businesses to consistently keep their telephone numbers, not only when switching service providers, but also when moving outside of their immediate locality. I would like to thank the team in the Competition Policy Division for their work on this proceeding. Our colleagues in the Office of General Counsel also provided us with invaluable input. Seated at the table with me from WCB's Competition Policy Division are Daniel Kahn, Division Chief, and Stevens, Deputy Division Chief, and Sherwin C. Special Counsel. Sherwin will now present the item. 
Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The report and order before you, if adopted, would make three adjustments to our requirements for certain telecommunications carriers. First, the report and order would extend to competitive local exchange carriers a forbearance granted to their incumbent competitors three years ago. In 2015, the Commission forbore from the Communications Act's toll inter-exchange dialing parity requirements as they apply to incumbent local exchange carriers. At the time, the Commission found that these dialing parity requirements were no longer necessary given the changes in the competitive landscape since their inception with fewer and fewer customers using standalone long-distance carriers. This remains true today. Accordingly, the order would find that competitive local exchange carriers should have the benefit of the same flexibility as incumbent local exchange carriers, both to level the playing field and to permit more carriers more flexibility to implement changes that can benefit nationwide network portability. Second, the 2015 forbearance left in place the dialing parity requirements for customers who, at the time, had existing plans with standalone long distance carriers. As the number of customers with these grandfathered standalone plans continues to decline, the order would extend the forbearance from the toll and exchange dialing parity requirements to these plans as well to further ensure a level playing field, but also to further encourage nationwide number portability. Third, the order would amend an existing database query requirement in our rules. Specifically, the so-called N-1 requirement mandates the second to last carrier in a call flow be the one to query the number portability database. However, to allow for greater flexibility to implement nationwide number portability and to encourage routing efficiencies, the order would amend the rule to allow upstream carriers to perform the query if they chose to do so. The Bureau recommends the adoption of this report and order and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. C, for the presentation. Uh, Commissioner Riley, for any comments. Thank you. The goal of full number, nationwide number portability is a laudable one and could be beneficial, at least in the short term, for those individuals who have some affinity to the local telephone number. In the grand scheme, however, consumers' reliance on telephone numbers will likely to continue to dwindle as modern technology eliminates the need. Society is moving away from telephone numbers just like it moved away from fax machines and is moving away from wireline dial tone phones. Maybe that's progress, maybe not, but it is reality. Of note, in the text, the item only moves us along the path towards nationwide number portability. Appropriately, the item acknowledges that more complex and difficult leaps will be needed to reach fully operational portability. But today's steps, however minor, should be of help. In particular, eliminating dialing parity requirements for new entrants is appropriate, especially since the Commission already struck them for incumbent providers who were the original problematic targets of the rules in the first place. Similarly, providing flexibility on when local numbering portability databases queried will prevent carriers from duplication. For these reasons, I will approve. I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Two years ago, the head of Facebook's messaging app predicted the death of the phone number. Last year, the New York Post ran a story with the headline, asking for someone's phone number is over. While these predictions, as we've heard, have some grounding in recent tech trends, I tend to agree with a 2015 story that ran in the Post titled, Why New Yorkers Will Always Judge You for Your Area Code. Indeed, as we've seen a new 332 area code roll out across the Big Apple, Many Manhattanites confirm that numbers still have value. In fact, it reminds me of an episode from what might be one of Commissioner Rosenworcel's favorite TV shows, though this is uh, unconfirmed, Seinfeld. Uh, it's an episode when Elaine, am I off? You don't have the box set? <laughs> All right, digital only. Uh, when Elaine gets a new phone number with a 646 code, rather than New York's original 212. Elaine feels that she now must explain to fellow Manhattanites that the 646 code is not New Jersey, but rather it's just like 212 except they multiplied every number by three and then added one to the middle number. Whether you view a particular number as a status symbol or like me, enjoy a long-term relationship with your number, I've had mine since high school, it's been a long three years, Americans expect to keep their numbers when they move across the country. So it may come as a surprise, an unwelcome one, to find out that number portability is not ubiquitous nationwide. The inability to take your phone number with you when you move or change carriers is both an annoyance for consumers and a burden 
on competition, particularly for small and regional providers who may not be able to offer new customers the same ability to keep their phone numbers as larger nationwide providers. So I'm glad we're taking steps today to hasten the move towards nationwide number portability. Though we still have a ways to go to achieve full nationwide number portability, streamlining our regulatory requirements will enable carriers to more efficiently and flexibly route calls. I support this item and look forward to continuing to work with all stakeholders towards the full implementation of nationwide number portability. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. And remember, Elaine was a 718 when she first moved to New York and she cried every night. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Uh, no statement. I will just vote to support. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, nationwide number portability, or NNP, is one part of the FCC's efforts to promote competition and consumer choice. It means being able to keep your phone number when you switch to any carrier anywhere in the country. Now, unfortunately, this isn't possible for today for consumers who want to switch to certain carriers, typically smaller ones. But a lot has happened since we adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking and notice of inquiry on this topic last year. Not only have we received public input on our proposals, but in June, the North American Numbering Council, or NANCY, issued a report on the viability of specific models for achieving nationwide number portability. And just this month, we asked the NANCY to push forward with investigating the technical requirements necessary to support NNP, as well as the costs and benefits of several approaches to implementing it. Well, today, we take another step toward empowering consumers to change carriers anywhere in the country without having to change their phone numbers. Specifically, we amend our rules to allow carriers to decide amongst themselves which party should be responsible for querying the number portability database when routing a call. We also extend forbearance from inter-exchange dialing parity requirements to all carriers, so that now there will be regulatory parity across all carriers. Now, I recognize fully that this is all pretty dry and technical, but this order matters. It matters because we are clearing away outdated rules to enable creative thinking about how calls can be handled more efficiently. It matters because we are aiming to implement nationwide number portability in a way that most benefits and least disrupts consumers. My hope is that with our actions today and with the ongoing work by Nancy and the industry, we'll soon bring about nationwide number portability. That will result in more competition, more consumer choice, and more convenience. A thank you to the FCC staff who worked on this order, uh, Heather Hendrickson, Dan Kahn, Chris Monteith, Sherwin C., and Ann Stevens from the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Terry Cavanaugh and Rick Mallon from the Office of General Counsel. We'll now proceed to a vote on the item. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Approved. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approved. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the sixth and final item on your agenda will be presented by the Enforcement Bureau and is entitled Amendment of Procedural Rules Governing Formal Complaint Proceedings Delegated to the Enforcement Bureau. Rosemary Harold, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And batting cleanup, whenever you're ready, Ms. Harold, the floor is ready for you. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Enforcement Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a report and order creating a uniform set of procedural rules for formal complaint proceedings delegated to the Bureau. This report and order, if adopted, would streamline and consolidate procedural rules governing formal complaints filed under Section 208 of the Act, poll attachment complaints filed under Section 224 of the Act, and formal complaints concerning advanced communication services and equipment filed under Sections 255, 716, and 718 of the Act. With me at the table are Christopher Killian, Deputy Chief of the Enforcement Bureau, Rosemary McEnry, Chief of the Market Disputes Resolution Division, and Mike Engel, also of the Market Disputes Resolution Division. Mike will present the item. Thank you, Rosemary. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Three different sets of procedural rules presently govern the formal complaints that the Enforcement Bureau handles. The Commission enacted the rules at different times and they are not congruent. Such inconsistencies 
have led to, a needless and have led to needless confusion in some situations. This report and order, if adopted, would streamline, coordinate, and refine the rules by doing the following. Creating uniform deadlines for filing answers and replies. Extending to all formal complaint proceedings the option of requesting inclusion on the accelerated docket. Extending interrogatories to all three types of formal complaints without the need to request permission. Requiring a certification of pre-filing settlement efforts that includes executive level discussions in Section 208 and disability access formal complaint proceedings. Codifying the current practice of providing staff supervised mediation services and clarifying that parties may request mediation as long as the dispute is pending before the commission. Clarifying that defendants may file motions to dismiss. Creating a 270 day shot clock for resolution of formal complaints commencing upon the filing of a complaint which may be paused by staff in consultation with the parties. Poll access complaints would remain subject to a 180-day shot clock, and complaints filed pursuant to Section 208B1 will remain subject to a five-month deadline. And finally, clarifying language in the informal complaint rules to comport with long-standing commission practice. The Enforcement Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Engel, for the presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the Commission takes an important step towards streamlining our rules and procedures. Combining multiple unnecessarily separate enforcement complaint procedures is both appropriate and beneficial. Correctly, this item appears to unify these structures to reduce confusion and generate quicker resolution for those seeking redress under various statutory provisions. In doing so, it also should be uh, be, bring added efficiencies to the Commission as staff will now operate under a common set of procedures. I thank the Chairman for working me, with me to maintain transparency and efficiency provisions pertaining to poll attachments. Specifically, complaints, complainants must still include information regarding poll cost in their complaint, and the utility poll owners must provide such information upon request before a complaint is filed. Having this information can cut down on the number of complaints ultimately filed with the Commission. On a larger scale, I cannot help but note that many of the elements contained in these newly minted rules for complaints can and should be used in place of our administrative law judge process, which has proven to be fraught with pitfalls. pitfalls. In fact, there, are, there seems to be little that we could not adopt from these rules, including staff interrogatories, fact-finding procedures, and appropriate timelines to reduce or strike altogether the flawed ALJ system. So I commend the chairman for the wonderful effort contained in today's item to unify, simplify, and generate efficiency, and implore my colleagues to extend this work to other parts of the Commission, including the ALJ. I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thank you. Today's decision is another win for good government. Over the course of the FCC's 20 years of experience running formal complaint proceedings in front of the Enforcement Bureau, three different and somewhat inconsistent set of procedural rules have developed. The lack of uniformity has made it more difficult for parties to present their case and for FCC staff to conduct the proceedings. We fix this today by adopting a uniform set of procedural rules that will govern all of these cases. This will provide certainty to stakeholders while helping the Enforcement Bureau conduct efficient reviews as they work under tight statutory deadlines. I want to thank my colleagues in particular for accommodating my request that we also codify our existing approach to motions to dismiss. Under the FCC's existing case law, parties may file motions to dismiss that are similar to the ones that we filed in federal court under Rule 12b-6. These motions can provide parties with a more efficient path to dispute resolution in the appropriate case. But since the FCC hasn't codified our practice, not all parties have been able to know about it or benefit from it. So as part of our efforts to ensure that all stakeholders have a level playing field when it comes to our procedural rules, I'm glad my colleagues agree that we should codify this unwritten rule. I want to thank the staff, the Enforcement Bureau, for your work on the item. It has my support. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenwessel. You know, at the outset, I want to point out that we did not receive a draft of what we are voting on till 11.26 a.m., nearly 
an hour after this meeting started. I think that is unfair to my office and unfair to any of us who have to vote on any agency matter. All right. Every month, the Federal Communications Commission receives between 25 and 30,000 informal complaints. By any measure, that's a lot. But every one of these complaints is important. It's the way that consumers can tell us that they have concerns about communications, a rough experience with a provider, unexpected charges, or an inability to receive service that is unfair and requires attention. These stories that consumers tell us are the starting point for action. Because after they're filed, the agency studies the complaint, determines what happened, and then works with providers to fix consumer problems. For decades, this has been the long-standing practice of this agency. But for reasons I do not understand, today's order cuts the FCC out of the process. Instead of working to fix problems, the agency reduces itself to merely a conduit for the exchange of letters between consumers and their carriers. Then, following the exchange of letters, consumers who remain unsatisfied will be asked to pay a $225 fee to file a formal complaint just to have the FCC take an interest. This is bonkers. No one should be asked to pay $225 for this agency to do its job. No one should see this agency close its doors to everyday consumers looking for assistance in a marketplace that can be bewildering to navigate. There are so many people who think Washington is not listening to them and that rules at agencies like this one are rigged against them. And today's decision only proves that point. I believe we should be doing everything within our power to make it easier for consumers to file complaints and seek redress and not mask changes that affect consumers in so-called formal complaint process changes. This decision utterly fails the test of making sure we help consumers. I dissent. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Before I get into my uh, formal statement, I did have a few questions uh, for the Enforcement Bureau. <clears throat> First question, did the Commission provide notice and seek comment on the revisions to the text of the informal complaint rule, which was included in the draft that was publicly released three weeks ago? Uh, yes, the Commission did in September 2017 um, in its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking specifically propose to change the text of that rule. Uh, Chief Harold, can you please tell us whether any commissioners dissented from the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking that was issued in September of 2017? No, none of the five commissioners sitting at that time dissented. Uh, since, what is, since it was included in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking over nine months ago, did any commenter object to or express any concern about the change to the text of the informal complaint rule? No. In fact, there were no comments whatsoever about that particular rule. Uh, would the draft's proposed modification to the informal complaint rules have any impact on how the FCC deals with informal complaints? No. The proposed rule only clarifies existing practice, which has been in place since 1986. Namely, that the informal complaint process facilitates a dialogue and negotiation, but does not result in a formal commission ruling. Would the draft's proposed modification impede in any way the commission's ability to take enforcement actions on the basis of informal complaints? No. The commission regularly takes into account informal complaints when taking enforcement actions and will continue to do so going forward. Is there any truth to the media reports that Americans will now have to pay $225 as a fee to file a complaint with the FCC? No, those reports are false. No, those reports are false. Thank you. Uh, I just want to point out for the record, I disagree. Uh, th I thank you for the career staff of the FCC for providing those answers. Uh, to my statement, today we have three different procedures for the distinct uh, types of formal complaints that are handled by the Enforcement Bureau. This has occasionally produced confusion and inconsistent results. And in many cases, the different procedures and disparate results are more a result of history than logic. So today, following up on the FCC's strategic plan of 
uh, in which I prioritized reforming the FCC's processes and following up on the unanimous notice of proposed rulemaking that was issued in September of 2017. We streamline and generally bring greater consistency to the rules governing formal complaints regarding common carriers, poll attachments, and advanced communications services and equipment. These updates will simplify and expedite the process for handling formal complaints that will both serve the public better and make more efficient use of staff resources. A thank you to Tracy Bridgham, Rizwan Chowdhury, Michael Engel, John Garvin, Lisa Griffin, Rosemary Harold, Chris Killian, Sharon Lee, Rosemary McInerney, and Lisa Sachs from the Enforcement Bureau, Adam Copeland, Lisa Hone, Dan Kahn, and Michael Ray from the Wireline Competition Bureau, Robert Aldrich, Micah Caldwell, Rosalind Crawford, Susie Singleton, and Kim Wilde from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, and Melina Barzlai, Ashley Boisel, Rick Mallon, Linda Oliver, Bill Richardson, and Ryan Yates from the Office of General Counsel. We'll now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Oh, sorry, Commissioner O'Reilly. Sorry. Votes aye. <laughs> sorry. Commissioner O'Reilly or Carr, depending on. Approved. <laughs> Commissioner Rosenworcel. I know we get all the men up here confused. <laughs> Uh, I dissent. Uh, the chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted <laughs> as requested. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to offer any announcements at this time? Commissioner Rosenworth. All right. We have someone new in our office. Aurel Porter has joined us and will be sitting in the front. She is calm, cool, collected. She has worked for the Office of Legislative Affairs here for some time. She knows the building knows the issues, and we are so pleased that she is now part of our office and part of our team. I also want to point out, because I neglected to do so a few months ago, that Umer Javad, my wireless and public safety advisor, has become a father for the second time. His daughter Layla was born back in March. And um, we've got some other folks who might be due soon in our office, so I wanted to make sure we gave Layla her due. And uh, in addition, I think it's a neat fact to add that Umer, who had a career with the Albemarle County Fire Department before becoming a lawyer, has now rejoined the firefighting force of the uh, Loudoun County Fire Department as a volunteer fire firefighter, in addition to his duties here. So um, I think that nets out to being that we can make fires in our office, but we can also put them out. <laughs> uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioners uh, Riley or Carr? Uh, so I have a few uh, announcements in our office. Uh, most notably, we have a, a, a new addition as well to uh, OCH. Uh, Rachel Bender, our wireless international and engineering advisor, had a bouncing baby boy earlier this week. He arrived a couple of weeks early. Uh, Joshua Henry Bender is his name, and uh, he's... Oh, yeah. I suggested the name Ajit Bender. Somehow it didn't seem to be that mellifluous to her, but you know, we all have our personal tastes, I suppose. Yes, yeah. But uh, Joshua is very cute. He's uh, engaging his parents, and uh, we are very excited to meet him uh, when uh, the time is right. Uh, unfortunately, we also announced a departure. Kim Matos has left our office and gone back to the Office of General Counsel. Kim is an old friend of mine uh, when she and I were uh, buddies in the Office of General Counsel, along with Chris Killing and a few others. Uh, she has done terrific work for the Chairman's Office. She's a good friend, but she's only down the hall, so we won't miss her too terribly. Uh, and stepping into her shoes as executive assistant will be Andy Rowan. Uh, Andy is uh, serving with M Matthew Berry, Nat Nick Degani, uh, Michael Karowitz, and Nirali Patel. She's also listening to Nick's laughs. Uh, she served in various roles, including most recently serving as staff assistant for one of the more difficult commissioners uh, to work with at the FCC, uh, Commissioner Carr, I understand. Served most, pr most prestigiously with us. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, prestige, that's what was written on the script. I just yeah. uh, ad-libbed there. Uh, she was also special assistant to the chief of the Wireline Telecommunications Bureau. She spent two decades in the private sector, and most importantly, she has an always stocked bowl of candy, including Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, at her desk. So we are very grateful to her for that. Uh, my last announcement is going to be that the uh, girls in tech are visiting. This is a terrific program that is uh, initiated by the Department of State. Every year, they bring young women, uh, typically from the Middle East, to come to the United States and to explore what it means to have a, a career, uh, uh, an academic career as well as a professional career in STEM fields. It is one of the best programs that we have the chance to participate in every year. Uh, the girls come from across the, you know, that region, from Morocco all the way to Saudi Arabia. 
And it's a nice bookend to the event I had yesterday where I had the privilege of representing the United States at the International Telecommunications Union's uh, Global Symposium for Regulators, where yesterday morning I had a chance to meet with a variety of women from Azerbaijan all the way to Zambia who are trying to promote a more inclusive, uh, more uh, open, and a more focused ITU effort when it comes to digital policy making. And so I think whether it's uh, the women who are working at the ITU uh, for change or young women who are seeking to enter this field, um, I think this is a very ripe time uh, for diversity and inclusion, uh, and I'm very proud to support it. Uh, with that, I will turn to our illustrious secretary to announce the date of the next FCC Commission agenda meeting. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communica Communications Commission is Thursday, August 2nd, 2018. Thank you, and with that, we stand adjourned. We're here to get started with the open meeting press conference. I'm gonna turn it over to Chairman Pai. Uh, thank you, Tina. Uh, as you may have noticed, tomorrow is Friday the 13th, and it, as it turns out, today is one of those calendar quirks at the FCC that can also evoke nightmares, uh, when white copy and our open meeting fall on the same day. So uh, that means that this has been a really busy 24 hours for all of you and for us, so I will be brief and to the point. Uh, the FCC has been moving aggressively to make low band, mid band, and high band airwaves available for flexible use so that the United States will lead the world in 5G. We made news yesterday when we announced plans to move forward with a single auction of the upper 37 gigahertz, 39 gigahertz, and 47 gigahertz bands in the second half of 2019. And today, we focused on putting mid-band spectrum to its highest value use. Uh, this morning, the FCC voted to propose to make more intensive use of airwaves from 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz, what we commonly call the C-band. We'll be exploring the best way to transition some or all of this mid-band spectrum to terrestrial fixed and mobile broadband services while accommodating the needs of incumbents. Advanced wireless services like 5G demand that we bring more spectrum to market quickly. And so today, yet again, the FCC is moving forward to meet that demand. FCC action was also required because false alarms have exposed flaws in our emergency alerting system. Today, we responded to this need by adopting new rules that will enable state and local officials to conduct more effective emergency alert system testing and public outreach. They will help prevent false alerts and invite input on additional steps to address such alerts. Fewer false alerts will mean more confidence in this life-saving system. With that, may your Friday the 13th be lucky and may your well-deserved weekend feel long. And I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, yeah, Chairman Pai, Monty Taylor, Communications Daily. Uh, you asked the Hill for money to revamp ECFS. I was wondering if you could tell us how much that's going to cost, when it might happen, and what exactly you're going to do to it. I can't provide any uh, particulars on logistics at this time, but I can say that the request is pending before the Senate Appropriations Committee. Margaret, Margaret McGill with Politico. Um, Commissioner Rosenworcel mentioned that the text of the um, complaints item wasn't available until 1130. I'm wondering, did the FCC change any parts of the proposal in response to concerns from Democrats? The, the item that we voted upon today is exactly the same as the item that was re released publicly three weeks ago. What was the reason for the delay then? The delay of? Making the final text available to commissioners. Uh, the, again, there was no change to the text, so it was simply a matter of you know, sharing the original text with all the offices, which, which uh, again, was available to the offices many weeks ago. Okay. Hi, Chairman Pai, Kelsey Hi. Griffiths with Law360. I just wanted to see if you can comment on uh, Judge Kavanaugh's previous record in dealing with FCC decisions and um, any impact on the Supreme Court if confirmed. Uh, no comments on his uh, judicial record other than to say that I congratulate him on his nomination to serve as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. I believe he's highly qualified and uh, look forward to the confirmation process as it unfolds. Thank you. John, John Reed, Bloomberg Law. Um, NTA, um, citing national security risks, has recommended that the FCC deny um, China Mobile a request to offer tele telecom services in the U.S. Um, do you plan to follow that recommendation? Uh, we just received that recommendation uh, from NTIA, and this uh, proceeding, as you know, has been uh, pending at the FCC mm -hmm. for a time. So we are going to take that into consideration and study all of the other uh, relevant facts that are in the record before rendering the appropriate judgment. 
Howard Busker, Communications Daily. I would just want there, there was a letter that the Wireless Bureau sent to Dish earlier this week that's gotten a lot of attention, and every and analysts have been saying it's a pretty tough letter. Are you concerned about that about making sure that Dish gets the spectrum in play because they're sitting on a, on a lot of of spectrum right now? Uh, the letter speaks for itself. We just wanted to gain additional facts from the party, and uh, we look forward to receiving uh, whatever response uh, the party submits in due course. Hi, I'm Toby from Policy Tracker. I'm wondering if you personally have a view on how much the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band should be made available for flexible use, and if that should be an example for other countries, because, I mean, in Europe we talk about going up to 3.8 gigahertz, for example, and Riley was talking about going up much further. With respect to the first component of your question, uh, we don't have a preconceived view. That's precisely the reason why we wanted to issue this notice of proposed rulemaking. It was important to me personally to tee up a number of different approaches uh, for dealing with that C-band uh, spectrum. And so we hope to get robust public input on whatever uh, folks think the right course is. Uh, ultimately, of course, we want to make reach the highest valued use. And uh, with respect to the, uh, I think you said what lessons might this uh, portend for Europe or for other regions. Uh, I, I can't say I would uh, you know, refer you to them, but what I will say, having just uh, been in Geneva and met with a number of my counterparts from many different countries and regions of the world, is that folks are eagerly looking to the United States uh, for leadership in a variety of mid and high bands uh, spectrum. And uh, they have saluted the FCC uh, for having a very forward-thinking approach on a number of different bands, including this one. And that was one of the gratifying things to hear is that our efforts uh, on all kinds of low, mid, and high band spectrum are being recognized. And the 5G leadership is, uh, is something that has been re being recognized by other countries. Yeah, hi, David Cout at Communications Daily. You say the uh, uh, complaint item is exactly as it was. I'm looking at the informal complaint language. It does seem to suggest you'll forward informal complaints on to carriers or whoever the target is, and when you get an answer back, if it looks like it's satisfied, you may at your discretion consider it closed. In all other cases, the commission will uh, notify the complaint. They can file a formal complaint, which apparently does cost $225. Um, so what does this language change if, if you're making a, a change here of some sort? Because Commissioner Rosenworcel is basically saying you're just becoming a conduit rather than dealing with the formal, the informal complaints. So what are you changing and how is that not now being a conduit? Again, nothing is substantively changing about the way the FCC handles informal complaints. Additionally, this follows up on the unanimous notice of proposed rulemaking that was issued in September of 2017 in which this change was described in footnote 18 and the rules appendix. In addition to that, I would refer you to the Enforcement Bureau career staff, which will be here available to answer these and any other questions, which will simply, and I would anticipate based on the colloquy I had with Enforcement Bureau Chief Rosemary Harold, that she will say too, that again, nothing is changing with respect to the informal complaints handling process and that consumers will continue to be able uh, to so, press. So what has changed here though? Again, I would refer you to the Enforcement Bureau a Chief. She will describe that nothing substantively has changed. We're simply caught the practices that have been in place since 1986 for handling a variety of complaints. Can you confirm? Can oh. oh, yeah, Dave Shepardson from Reuters. Um, two, two, two of our questions. One on, uh, on ZTE. Uh, can you tell us, are your, have your thoughts changed about the national security risks uh, related to ZTE given that the U.S. government just made a, a deal to allow them to remain in business? Uh, and secondly, you got a petition to hold in advance your consideration of the Sinclair Tribune transaction until this, the, the D.C. Circuit rules. Can you say if you've made a decision whether you're going to honor that request or are you, are you proceeding? Uh, no decision on the second question and on the first. I uh, will stickly, uh, strictly stick with uh, the supply chain notice of proposed rulemaking uh, that the FCC has issued, and I can't comment beyond the four corners of that notice at this point. Point, we'll transition to the Bureau Conference with my colleague Mark Wickfield. Good afternoon. Um, so we'll go Bureau by Bureau. There are two um, wireless items. Are there questions on the wireless items? There are. So the Wireless Bureau, <clears throat> please come up. And the OET, sorry. 
Julie? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Howard, fire away. I don't th my first question was uh, that we had heard that there might be some changes to the order, or to, yeah, to the order part because of concerns about some smaller satellite operators and you know their filing requirements. But that doesn't seem to be covered in the news release, and nobody really. I don't think anybody mentioned it during. Were there any changes in terms of the procedures? Sure, uh, I can uh, answer at a high level. Uh, there were some changes in the order. Uh, some of the data that was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, requested of Earth Station licensees was moved to the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, uh, and instead uh, there was a requirement added that existing licensees that did not file recently within the filing wi window had to recertify that the information in the licensing system was correct. There were some additional questions added for transportable earth stations, uh, and there were some additional questions uh, added to the order for uh, space stations. And I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear on, on something. So for some of the smaller operators, will they have some kind of filing requirements as a result of the order? If they are existing that did not file recently, they simply have to recertify that the information that is currently in the licensing system is correct. Am I correct about that, yes. Matthew? Yep. And then there's unless they're unless they're transportable per station. Right. Okay. And then there's more information that will be required from larger players as part of the order. We simply ask uh, in the notice of proposed rulemaking whether there should be uh, additional information uh, asked of. Earth stations. So that's a change from the yes, draft, that, right? right? Okay. It is. All right. Thank you. Sorry. And that they said small versus large. So, right. Yeah, small versus large. That would be good. No difference. No, no difference. Yeah. No okay. difference between from the Earth stations. What we're requesting does make a difference whether you're a small Earth station operator or a large station Earth station operator. And I also want to. I always was. I, I always appreciate having a full lineup of people up there to answer <laughs> these questions. So. Yeah, we're concerned what questions. You <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question about that as well. I noticed that the National Academy of Sciences expressed some concern that radio astronomy and other scientific research might uh, kind of get bumped out of this band is uh, divided up for sharing. How does this order address that? Yeah, it's, it's just general comments, not, it's not in this band. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Hello. Hi. Following up on, on what Howard is asking about um, the information disclosure requirements, what are we now asking from space uh, station operators, and, and why are we asking it now from them and not only from the Earth station, Earth station operators themselves? Uh, well, uh, uh, you will see the uh, detailed information when the uh, draft comes out, or the uh, order and notice comes out. Uh, but essentially, we uh, concluded that uh, much of the information that we had requested of the Earth stations, we could uh, obtain uh, from the space stations, in which case we would be asking it from uh, fewer entities and imposing fewer burdens overall on the various licensees. So, so, so seeing as we're not differentiating between the large and the small Earth station operators, that means that we're asking less of the Earth station operators now because we're getting information from the space station operators instead. And we're inviting comment on a potential further collection from the Earth Station operators as well. Okay. So I have another question, actually. Okay, if I go can. Ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm just asking where we got to in terms of abolishing the full band, full arc coordination uh, protection. Um, will satellite operators be able to grow their services in the band um, as a result of um, this NPRM? Um, well, the, the, the item does pro propose to reform full band, full arc. Um, but we do seek comment on providing flexibility to Earth stations so that they can change their operations and, you know, be flexible um, as, as, you know, business conditions change and, and other things uh, change that they need to react to. So. Any 
further questions on these two items? Just any, any sense yeah. of when this because it sounds like it's still going to be a little confusing. Like, so, are, is there are, is there any sense of when this is going to be actually posted? Um, in the next few business days. Next couple of days. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next item is the uh, Media Bureau's uh, children's television item. Monty has some questions on that. So, Media Bureau, come on up. Uh, Monty Taylor, Com Daily. I just had some quick questions. There was some back and forth uh, between Commissioner O'Reilly and Commissioner Rosenworcel about whether the item got changed or not. Does the item still contain the tentative conclusions, the draft? Yes. It, I, mean, I guess it's not a draft anymore, but it does still have the tentative conclusions in it. Is there anything that's changed other than, I guess nothing changed, right? Is there anything that's been altered because of them talking that uh, from the draft that came out originally? There was a, a question asked about re reporting requirements surrounding commercial limits, but okay. that's it. Okay, and then um, I also want to know what is the if you can tell me what the difference is if the uh, at, at, for the bureau if this had been an NOI instead of an NPRM, uh, what what would that do if I, somebody presented to me that an NPRM with no tentative conclusions is very close to an NOI? So I was wondering if that's true from your perspective. I think the main difference is if you have an NOI, you cannot go straight to order. Okay. So. The NPRM, even if it doesn't have specific rules attached to it, allows you, as a matter of law, to go straight to order. Okay. Uh, that's all I got. Okay. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the multicast stations. Um, and forgive me if this is overly simplistic, but is there an easy way for families to track down multicast stations or to view it? Um, it seems like that was maybe a point of contention. That's something we ask about in the item, about um, how readily um, consumers can essentially see program guides relating to the multicast stations that may be available on certain um, cable systems today, but that is something that we are seeking comment about. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item is emergency alerts. Any questions on the emergency alerts item? Okay, hearing none. Uh, uh, wireline competitions, uh, nas nationwide number portability, other questions on that item? Okay, none on that. And then the final one is the uh, complaint process from the Enforcement Bureau. And there are questions on that, so Enforcement Bureau, please come up. Thanks. Daily, um, can you tell us what the current, before this order, what the current practice of the uh, FCC Enforcement Bureau is with regard to informal complaints? Actually, it's a two, it's a two bureau approach, okay. to be clear. So what I'll talk about is the very general way this typically happens when we get informal complaints from consumers. Usually it goes to the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau first. Um, they're the ones who look at the, at the complaint initially figure out who the provider is, uh, typically then go to the provider with directions to respond. Um, if that response is not, doesn't solve the problem for the consumer, then often it will be referred to us at the Enforcement Bureau. We then work with the consumer and the provider, usually essentially setting up a kind of mediation, informal discussion to try to settle things without having to go through all of the formal rigmarole that's involved in a formal complaint proceeding um, that requires a lot of evidence on the record. I don't think that many consumers really want to get into the ins and outs of formal complaints, even beyond the issue of, of the fee associated with filing one, um, because it takes a lot of time. You have get, we get legalistic about what's really relevant evidence and not, and I think in most cases consumers just want their problem solved. Okay, and so what now has changed? Nothing. And Other than some words being taken out of the existing rule 
that might suggest that there's more to the informal complaint process than what I just described. So you anticipate that you'll continue to do this informal mediation and Absolutely. all of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, because I think that's that's probably the concern. It seems when you look at this language, it doesn't really say anything about that. Um, uh, and it kind of Perhaps suggests... you want to file a, uh, a request for rulemaking and ask us no. to add some more language no, <laughs> to no. the rule. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> just trying to understand because we obviously have kind of a he said, she said type situation here where people say, one side says this is just turning you guys into a conduit, and the other side, you guys say, no, nothing's substantively changing. Nothing substantively changing in the way that we've been handling this at the commission since 1986. Okay. All right. Margaret? <clears throat> okay, I'm just, Margaret McGill with Political. I just want to follow up on that, um, just to be really clear. So it seems like the language that you're getting rid of is this line about the commission will do this review and disposition. If, if that doesn't change how you're handling things, why get rid of that language in the first place? Because disposition typically is a legal word that suggests that there's going to be an official commission action. And in an informal complaint situation, if we can solve the consumer's problem without having to go to the legalistic action, we will do that. Um, so I didn't see a mention of fees in the item itself. Um, could you clarify a little bit more where this $225 fee is coming from and maybe why that's been brought up surrounding discussions of this item? That sits in the rules governing formal complaints. So, and that wasn't being changed either. So that's why you didn't see it in the item. Anything further on this one? Oh, uh -huh. Sorry. Right. One more. Um, I Commissioner Rosen Worsell mentioned that this wasn't available to commissioners until 11.30. Were you guys making changes to it this morning, or what's the reason for that? That's not really the Bureau's place um, to talk about the internal deliberations of the commissioners, so you should talk to them about that. I will say, generally speaking, that the way the process typically works is that in the three weeks leading up to a meeting item, some commissioners may ask for changes, um, may ask for changes near the end of the process. Sometimes that means that we get the draft back to them with the changes in it if, the, if enough votes um, are there to add it to the item um, as soon as we can. I can also say that the change to the informal complaint rule was in the item that was released publicly for everybody to see three weeks ago. Thank you very much. Oh, Chris, just uh, one point of clarification. Uh, Commissioner Pai, Chairman Pai, had said that there were no changes to the rules from the time uh, the original uh, draft order was circulated and made public and its adoption today. He was referring there to the informal complaint rules. Right. There were changes to some other sections, which right. the other commissioners talked about. Right. Oh, so the draft that was released? There was no change. Just, he's just saying to the informal. Correct. Right. Complaint right. Side. There right. were changes to there the There were rest changes of the to item. other parts. Oh, okay. That's a good clarification. Yeah, I misunderstood that. Okay. Can you tell us what those changes were? You can ask the commissioners or do a compare right between the uh, version that we can posted three weeks line? ago. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And now we have the uh, commissioners O'Reilly and Carr here, please. Hello, all. Any questions you may have that we could answer? Who wants to go first? We'll start down here and we'll go that way. Is that okay? Okay. I'm, I'm going to jump in line then. Okay. Um, Monty, what are you waiting for? Slow. Yeah. Spring Margaret in the last minute. You lost your slot. Uh, Margaret McGill with Politico. I was hoping you can give us an update on the 3.5 proceeding. I know you've been trying to make a recommendation. What's your timeline for that? I have uh, had a number of conversations recently. I'm in the process of, of uh, relaying my recommendations to the chairman, and then we'll have a conversation with him on next, next steps. But we're hopefully coming to a conclusion uh, after many, many, many months. Do you have a deadline for when you want to make that recommendation? I think I said last Christmas. I think that didn't work out exactly. <laughs> right, so this Christmas or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like to be done by yes. 
Uh, I can't promise that the auction itself would occur uh, by this Christmas. Uh, that seems probably unlikely. But um, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, 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 you know, barring some other unforeseen circumstances, I'd like to believe we will conclude far before this Christmas. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask both of you the same question I asked Herman Pye. Do you have any thoughts on Judge Kavanaugh's um, kind of history of dealing with FCC decisions and is, you know, does that hold any significance to you as he goes through this confirmation process? I have no involvement and have not, I'm not familiar with uh, his many uh, storied career. I, I did read, uh, obviously, his views on the net neutrality decision uh, at one time and, and, and it found some uh, common views along that, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, no, I have nothing on that question. Thanks, though. Thanks. Okay, um, I, I wanted to ask uh, first of all about Did the. Margaret, steal your question. No, no, actually, okay, I wasn't sure. My instincts are bad because I wasn't sure I was going to ask about three point five because it's like, well, we always ask about three point five, but now, but there's some sign, but there's some right, and, and that's why it was good that she went first, and so, um, so well, actually, since you mentioned three point five, so you said you made, you made your recommendation to the chairman, so just I to be. So, so you, you've, 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 you've recommended a, an approach that deals with PELS and all that stuff, and okay, so we'll likely see something pretty soon. Um, I wanted to ask about, I wanted to ask you both about C-band, and you know, I think you both sort of expressed concern that this process not drag on forever and ever and ever, uh, uh, you know, not, not to mention any other bands again, but um, what, how, how quickly do you, how quickly do you see, think realistically, what would you tell industry, how quickly realistically are they actually going to be able to start using the spectrum? You know, I'd have to, to, to you know, we're, we're to NPRM, it's, it's going to take a lot of comments on the different ideas that are put out there. There are a lot of ideas that I necessarily didn't agree with and talked about it in my statement. Right. Um, I, I have to said a lot of favorable things towards one particular approach. Um, we probably could have narrowed our focus, and that probably would have shortened our time frame. I can't predict right now, standing here, what how how soon we would be able to conclude to go to final rules, much less how soon they may be able to. Uh, but I don't want it to be something that's five or ten years down the road, and that's why I think that the one mechanism has a much better uh, path than, than than the others. Yeah, I think you know. Look, if you you look back, uh, the need to continue to push midband spectrum out there is something that we've known for a number of years now. And pretty quickly in 2017, uh, this commission moved forward with an NOI that teed up, among other things, this band. Now we've moved pretty quickly as well to get that to an NPRM. I think that signals that we're serious about moving quickly here. As I indicated, and as Commissioner Riley has noted, there's issues in the band that need to be worked through. And that's why I mentioned, in my view, uh, one of the proposals we tee up there potentially has the promise to get us moving to having this in the marketplace uh, for consumer use more broadly more quickly is this idea of continue to encourage potentially private sector negotiations. That's why I sort of emphasize that uh, in my view, but we'll see how the, the record plays out. And then, and then finally, it looks like they've reduced the amount of information that they're going to be asking um, companies up, you know, the satellite players for up front. Could that potentially slow things if some of these questions have been kind of pushed to the NPRM rather than just ask them now? No, I don't think so. I don't think that slows our, our movement forward on this proceeding. I found the, the modifications to, to address some concerns that people had raised, and I don't think that should slow things down, from my opinion. Thank you. Uh, uh, Alex is Toby from Policy Tracker. Um, you're both favoring the market-based uh, method of Intelsat and SES selling the spectrum to someone. I was wondering if you could clarify, uh, Commissioner Riley, you mentioned that you're looking for 200 or 300 megahertz of spectrum to be made available. But Intelsat and SES are talking about making 100 megahertz available for a mobile operator and then some guard band of 80 or something like this, I'm, I'm not sure. How do you um, envisage the 200 or 300 megahertz uh, going to uh, the mobile operators through that kind of method? Yeah, so um, I've, I've talked about the need for additional uh, spectrum for mid-band for quite a while. Uh, I think this is a prime location. I've talked to those companies who've been in. You can see my ex partes and made the same point to them that I don't think 100 is going to be sufficient for our purposes, um, and we're going to you know have to work and and, and re-examine uh, that commitment uh, and that proposal. And and that's what I'm suggesting again today that it's going to take more than 100 um, to 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 go through all of this work. 
uh, and to make, make, make a successful outcome uh, at the end of the day, in my opinion. So, so, so to clarify, th this means that what you're saying is that you wouldn't support the market-based mechanism anymore if they would continue to only uh, want to clear 100 and... Uh, yeah, I, didn't, I haven't dropped down red, uh, red lines on this exactly, but I, I do favor more than 100 megahertz. I think it's going to require more uh, than that to make all the... Uh, all, there's many different pieces to this equation. Uh, I talked about four principles, uh, and, but I think that, you know, if you look at it, I think it also requires addressing uh, 6 gigahertz. Uh, and making more unlicensed spectrum available there, and that has some intertwine with what we do in the downlink band. So uh, I, I think there are a lot of mis moving pieces, but to get to uh, finality in a quicker mode, I think it's going to require co cooperation. Um, everyone set aside the preconceived notions to move. Uh, if we move towards this market-based mechanism, which we haven't done before, uh, I, I find a lot of favorable uh, viewpoints towards it. Uh, it could set a new paradigm. Um, for how we deal with with clearing bands, and so uh, I'm excited on where we've where, where we are at the moment uh, and where it could go. Um, I think it's going to require more than 100 megahertz, in my opinion. Okay, great. I have another question on the market-based um, approach as well, which is about competition. Do you think um, there is a risk that there could be some distortion to competition if one mobile operator were to obtain that spectrum nationwide, for example, or, or do you not think that's really a risk and the SEC doesn't necessarily need to uh, put in place anything to um, ensure competition is going to happen? I think your question is a little premature, and no disrespect, but we don't know how much spectrum we're talking about, and so go ahead and refer to your previous question to know how much spectrum we're making available and whether that causes uh, any competitive issues. We have to kind of know greater landscape, I think, uh, from the comments in the record and, and, and understand that before we can you know, drill down to whether. If it, you know, I've made clear that I don't believe the spectrum should be teaspooned out um, you know, over the next decade. Uh, by the providers, given the, the work that we're going to have to do to make this happen. Okay, great. I mean, I, I don't want to monopolize your time, but I mean, it'd be good to ask about six gigahertz as well. There was a, um, a compromise um, uh, approach that was proposed by the Enlightenment community, something called AFC. I mean, do you, are you aware of that? Do you have any uh, comment on that kind of approach, if that can make Enlightenment six gigahertz happen? Yeah, there's a there's a large community in the in the high tech uh, field that have raised the possibility of unlicensed in this space and have presented uh, engineering studies for that purpose. I'm favorable towards that, and and that's why I worked with the chairman, and we're going to see an item on an NPRM later this fall uh, on six gigahertz that he's previously announced. So I'm excited about that, and and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to close that um, relatively, you know, depending on how how three seven to four two goes. Dave Kopp, Communications Daily. Uh, can either of you tell us uh, whether the informal complaint uh, procedure language was taken out and then put back in at the last minute here? And if so, you know, what were the reasons? I, can't, I was not party to those conversations. I, I, there are multiple conversations on multiple items in the, in the three-week period. Um, and especially in the last week of, 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 of sunshine, um, I, uh, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our quiet time, um, if you uh, look at uh, my comments regarding making documents available, I said that it wouldn't decrease the communications between commissioners. Um, and I think you're seeing an incidence where there was an attempt, if I understand correctly, there was an attempt to try and address different concerns. I had a similar approach as it relates to the KidVid process and trying to see if we couldn't find accommodations uh, those documents w were never materialized because they didn't get to a uh, conclusion. That's how uh, I see this from afar, that, that the document that we voted on was, uh, was uh, as relates to the informal pr procedure piece to be the same as the one that we had three weeks ago. Um, so I, I can't comment any more than that. Uh, there were other changes that were made. I obviously talked about the one that I saw as relates to clarifying the poll attachment language uh, and something that we talked through all the commissioners to get approval. Uh, to, to, to include, so, uh, or at least everyone was aware of that process. So uh, I'm, that's about as much as I know on the situation. There may have been other things that other people, maybe other questions to other people would be better. Yeah, I think it's been pretty thoroughly discussed. I think uh, as a general matter, as we saw with, with the KidVid item, uh, once something circulates, there's a lot of edits that go back and forth, attempts to reach common ground to get to unanimous votes, and if ultimately we don't get there, a lot of times we end up, uh, as was the case with KidVid, back to where we started from with the publicly circulated draft, and that happens uh, all the time at the agency. Monty down here at the end. Yes, speaking 
Uh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Shimmer or shine? Uh, could, you, could you tell me, uh, you were willing to uh, agree to Commissioner Rosenworcel's uh, ask to take out the tentative conclusions, but then she didn't vote for it. Were there other things that she asked for that you didn't agree with? I don't want to get into particulars of conversations, but I think that was generally uh, the, the thrust of her her uh, her ask. It wasn't. There are other people who have made similar requests as well. We were trying to figure out if we could find accommodations. It just didn't work out uh, at the time period, um, and so we'll move forward uh, as we intended. Uh, and then a quick follow up. You uh, you said that asking for an NOI is creating an unnecessary delay. Can you explain why there is a time pressure to? to get through this rulemaking? I mean, it could, don't you have time to start with an NOI? You know, we were looking back on last commission uh, and the previous years, and I think we, uh, I may be proven wrong, but I think we only found like three NOIs, uh, and none of them pertain to the big ticket items of net neutrality or the lifeline reviews, that, that the massive expansion of lifeline, expanding it to broadband, or the E-rate program and doubling its budget. No NOIs were conducted uh, of those process, uh, and, you know. So I, I'm troubled by the idea that this is some, you know, uh, radical step that we have skipped uh, along the, the, the means. We, the NPRM provides the particular opportunity for everyone to comment with some more specificity rather than having vagaries out there uh, and dragging the process, in this case, for another six, nine, whatever, who knows, uh, time period. Uh, and so I think it's important to act, to modernize our rules. It's consistent with the statute uh, and, and reflect what's happening in the marketplace today. And I've been pushing for that not only in the last two years or a year and whatever many months, but also in my previous three years in the last administration or last commission. So I think it's important to act uh, on, on many issues. And if you see uh, I push to, to uh, expedite many items, this isn't the only one. Uh, I don't like to see things drag on. Um, in, in, in the discussions. Thank you. Sure. Um, given kind of the confusion, I guess, around this informal complaints issue and like are people going to be charged this money or not, why, why didn't either of you say, hey, maybe we just shouldn't change this part of the language? For me, it was in quite, that's why I asked the question to double, to, to make sure that the Enforcement Bureau was going to follow the same procedures they were doing before. And they said yes, and that was like no changes are going to be made to that. So I don't, I don't need to change, if the language is done as a technical uh, in a footnote, um, I don't need, you know, if the explanation is that the, the informal complaint will be handled the exact same way it was done before. Um, I get informal complaints that, that people email me and I send them down to the, inform, to the Enforcement Bureau for them to handle uh, on the same exact procedures. So once they were clarifying that the process wasn't going to change, then I'm comfortable with that uh, going forward. I, I, have, I have one more too for Commissioner Carr. Since Commissioner O'Reilly shared some information, an update on 3.5. I thought you'd probably feel some moral obligation to <laughs> let us know what's going on on wireless infrastructure and when we're going to see yeah, no, the no next new, big order. No new news to, to break on that. We're, we're working away. We're having great meetings with all stakeholders, local governments, groups, others, and uh, but nothing nothing to break on the timing for on that today. This is just a follow-up on the kid vid proceeding. And sure. forgive me if this is overly simple, but I'm just trying to okay. get a sense of the practical impacts of, of this. Can you give us examples of the channels or programs that might be impacted by this? And can you clarify that it does apply to public TV, as far as I understand? Kid vid does apply to public TV. Their reporting requirements and obligations are a little different. Um, they have expansive programming and far exceed whatever we would establish uh, at the commission. But to, in terms of the channels, uh, so the KidVid applies to local broadcast stations, not to cable uh, and not to uh, over-the-top providers. Uh, so for local broadcast stations, we're uh, trying to figure out if our rules as, as implemented from 1996, 2004, 2006 should be altered and ask a ton of questions on how best, if so, uh, if they are to be changed, what they should look like, and provide a, you know an opportunity for everyone to comment uh, in the months ahead about that process. Um, does that get what you're seeking? Yeah, that helps. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Right. Um, I'll either of you would want to comment on the proposal regarding 37 to 42 gigahertz about removing coordination around full band, full arc of the satellite earth stations. Well, I think um, you can see my statement where I question whether that would actually, you know, what the implications are of that. 
Uh, so I do have some concerns along those fronts. So could you elaborate on that, maybe? And, I think uh, you should, uh, you should see my, yeah, see my statement right. Uh, I do worry ab ab about that and what the practical implications are, and I'm looking forward to the NPRM flushing that out and looking at both uh, all interested parties in commenting on that, that, uh, that potential change. And, and Commissioner Carr, do you, want anything to, do you want to add anything on that? I do not, no. I'm happy to have the conversation. This is the start of it, and we're going to get feedback on these issues, and I'm looking forward to that. Okay. And I was wondering if either of you wanted to comment on the reduction of information that's now going to be I proposed. You, said you weren't to looking be... to monopolize the time here. <laughs> All right, fine, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> it's, I, I, honestly, it's my last question. Um, uh, yeah, so it's about the information requirements, um, and, well, the proposal for the information requirements, and the scope of them is reduced by the sounds of it. Do you want to comment on that change, either of you? I think I think I might answer that earlier. I, I, my, my understanding is there were complaint, concerns are raised regarding our information collection process, and, and, and parties asked that we change that. I don't know that it will have any immediate impact. Um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I think the, the breadth of information that we will collect will be sufficient to make the decisions uh, going forward. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I think we made some tweaks to it and doesn't, in my view, uh, long-term change the trajectory of timing as to when we'll get this proceeding wrapped up. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Looking around. Anyone else? Last question. John Donnelly, no? Okay. All right, I guess we're all going to be last to lunch. Questions? Go ahead. With Law 360, um, you mentioned today that you are the only mom on the commission right now, and you also joked that it's easy to get all the men on the dais mixed up. So <laughs> I just wanted to ask how it's going as the lone Democrat on the commission and as the only female on the commission right now. Uh, it's going great. Uh, don't think it's any barrier to me saying what I think needs to be said. I suspect that today's meeting was proof of that fact. Thanks. Go ahead, Monty. Uh, yeah, Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Uh, Commissioner Rosewurst, I just want to ask you the same thing I asked Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, you guys, you know, from what you said up there, you were coming to an agreement about removing the tentative conclusions, but then you didn't vote for the item. Is there some other thing that you wanted changed in the item mm -hmm. on top of that that? that he wouldn't give you, or, or uh, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if there was an ask that wasn't fulfilled that led to you not mm -hmm. voting for it. Uh, I did my office had terrific meetings with Commissioner O'Reilly's staff. We tried to reach some resolution on these matters, but in the end, we felt that merely removing the tentative conclusions was not sufficient. And we were not comfortable with the final text of the item and continue to believe that a notice of inquiry would be the best way to proceed. So while we had productive conversations, we were just were not able to reach resolution by the end. Thank you. Uh, Margaret McGill, Politico. Uh, talking with the chairman and then also the enforcement bureau chief, uh, both kind of said that this change is substantive and this disposition language is just is a legal word that suggests there's going to be an official commission action, and they're saying that this is not actually going to change the process. So I, I, I take it you disagree with that. Can you explain why? <laughs> yeah. This agency gets between 25,000 and 30,000 consumer complaints filed informally every month. Lots of people who find that they've got charges on their bills that they don't believe they should be paid are people who feel like that service is not treating them fairly or they can't get service. And so they call us and seek help for us to resolve them. And for decades, under all kinds of leadership, it has been the practice of this agency to take those informal complaints and then reach out to the provider and help them with the consumer going back and forth to try to see if they can reach resolution. And under our current rules for informal complaints, if they reach resolution, we can close it out. But if not, our language says that the agency has a duty to contact the consumer who complains and figure out a way to get it resolved. 
That's a good policy. I do not understand why we would want to change it. Because you can read the text of the draft item, and what you'll see is though the headline says we're only making changes to formal complaints, if you look in the back in the appendix, they've snuck in changes to our informal complaint rules. And when we change our informal complaint rules, we make clear that we will serve as a conduit between providers of services and the consumer with the informal complaint. But if that consumer is not satisfied, then our language has been changed because we just say they can file a formal complaint. To file a formal complaint at this agency costs $225. That's bonkers. We shouldn't be telling consumers who come to us seeking redress that the price of us listening to them is $225. I do not understand why anyone thinks that's a good idea. There are so many people who think that Washington is not listening to them, that the system is rigged against them, that agencies like this one are stacking up rules that make it harder for everyday consumers to figure out how to navigate the marketplace. I think we just proved their point today, and I think that that is really unfortunate. Howard Besker, Communications Daily. Two spectrum-related questions. First of all, Commissioner O'Reilly said that there is something now that he, he's, he's given to the chairman on 3.5, and I know that's something you've been interested in. Do you have any concerns going into that? I mean, what are your thoughts headed? And it looks like, like we're probably going to have some kind of vote on that within the next, you know, within the next couple months, I would imagine. I certainly hope so. You know, the proposals for 3.5 are now three years old. It was three years ago that we proposed innovative action in this spectrum band that would create a hierarchy of rights that included preemptive right by existing incumbents, including government users, new forms of licenses, and then opportunistic unlicensed use. That was a really cool idea three years ago. It's a shame that we have sat for three years and we have not put that to market. I don't understand why it's taking us so long to resolve our thinking about this band, because as you heard from my formal statement, so many other countries around the world, South Korea, Spain, Italy, the United Kingdom, China, are all making moves on mid-band spectrum. And somehow the 3.5 band is still stuck in our bureaucracy. And then I also wanted to ask you, uh, you know, some of the FCC's spectrum initiatives have never really gotten very far, you know, like TV white spaces, for example. Yeah. But do you think the signs are that there's just an awful lot of interest in 3.5 and that looks like it really could be a very successful area for the FCC? What strikes me most about 3.5 gigahertz was that our original plans for it were wildly innovative. No one anywhere has done anything like that hierarchy of rights that were proposed initially in the 3.5 gigahertz band. That was innovative on par with an incentive auction in the 600 megahertz band and the unlicensed spectrum that eventually gave way to Wi-Fi in the 2.4 gigahertz band and 5 gigahertz band. I feel like we need to go back and look at the innovations that we've done in the past and make sure that where we go with 3.5 gigahertz band is on par with that kind of bold and different way of looking at things that uh, we've been known for in our United States spectrum policy in the past. And I, I still don't understand why this is stuck here and not moving. Thank you. Hi, Toby from Policy Tracker. I wanted to clarify on 3.7, 4.2 gigahertz. Do you have a view on how much spectrum should be cleared for exclusive mobile use and uh, a preference on the method that is uh, chosen to get there? Yeah, you know, that's the reason we have this broad-based rulemaking right here, right now. I, I put out a lot of questions in my statement that I hope to see that we have comments that respond to them when they do get filed here. But right now you have no sort of, um, what would you call it, um, uh, start starting point? Uh, the more spectrum that can be safely and securely freed for mobile, the better. But we do have challenges associated with existing users in this band as well. Okay. Commissioner, uh, yeah. can you tell us, was the informal complaint language taken out and then was that what was put back in at the last moment at 11.30 or whatever? <laughs> Can you give us anything on that? Yeah. It's really simple. I think before we vote on something, 
We should have the language before we enter this room. I don't think that's asking a lot. I think that's what basic fairness requires. I believed when I left the office late last night that we had an agreement to fix this mess that was made with the informal complaint process that makes our rules look like they're requiring consumers to pay $225 just to get resolution of some of their complaints. But about 20 minutes before this meeting, some kind of agreement was reached among my colleagues. I wasn't privy to it. And then an hour into the meeting, we were sent a new text. That text is different than the one that was released three weeks in advance of this meeting. And when it comes out, I invite you to take a look at it so you can see how. But they said the informal complaint language is no different. It's the exact same. There that's are true, and that's why I continue to have a problem with it. Yeah. But was it taken out, or were they, they just going to? They agreed to take it out at my request. Yeah. They rescinded that agreement 20 minutes before this meeting. Right. OK. And then just in terms of what this actually means, mm -hmm. the chairman says there's no substantive change. Then it's why just, do we make a change, right? Well, like, okay. I mean, here's well, I'm the thing. You, I'm going to ask you about it. It's, it's, yeah. just, it's just codifying existing practice. He said he referred us to the Enforcement Bureau. Rosemary Harold said the current practices, it goes to the Consumer Bureau. And if there's still a problem, then he sent it to the Enforcement Bureau. The, and, and then they, they engage in staff-mediated <laughs> efforts to try to work it out. And I, appreciate, I appreciate their understanding of it, but if you look at the language itself, it now makes clear that if they are not satisfied with resolution, they have to file a formal complaint. Filing a formal complaint costs $225. If you ask me, that's not progress changing our rules to make that clear. That's not progress for any consumer who's dissatisfied with their service and wants the FCC to help. Okay. Right. okay. Sorry, I, I have a question on the six gigahertz. On the six gigahertz band, um, there was this compromise proposal um, from the unlicensed community talking about automated frequency coordination. Right. I was, yeah, I was wondering if you had any comment on that proposal and in general the progress that the FCC is making on making available that band for unlicensed services. Uh, familiar with it, but I don't have any comments at this time. Okay. okay. All right, thank you.